This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Karen Savage, Waco, Texas, June 2006. Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 14 The Valley of Decision. Susan kept the flag flying at Ingleside all the next day, in honour of Italy's declaration of war. And not before it was time, Mrs. Dr. dear, considering the way things have begun to go on the Russian front. Say what you will, those Russians are kittle-cattle, the Grand Duke Nicholas to the contrary notwithstanding. It is a fortunate thing for Italy that she has come in on the right side, but whether it is as fortunate for the Allies I will not predict until I know more about Italians than I do now. However, she will give that old reprobate of Francis Joseph something to think about. A pretty emperor, indeed, with one foot in the grave and yet plotting wholesale murder. And Susan thumped and kneaded her bread with as much vicious energy as she could have expended in punching Francis Joseph himself, if he had been so unlucky as to fall into her clutches. Walter had gone to town on the early train, and Nan offered to look after Jims for the day, and so set Rilla free. Rilla was wildly busy all day, helping to decorate the Glen Hall and seeing to a hundred last things. The evening was beautiful, in spite of the fact that Mr. Pryor was reported to have said that he hoped it would rain pitchforks points down, and to have wantonly kicked Miranda's dog as he said it. Rilla, rushing home from the hall, dressed hurriedly. Everything had gone surprisingly well at the last. Irene was even then downstairs practicing her songs with Miss Oliver. Rilla was excited and happy, forgetful even of the western front for the moment. It gave her a sense of achievement and victory to have brought her efforts of weeks to such a successful conclusion. She knew that there had not lacked people who thought and hinted that Rilla Blythe had not the tact or patience to engineer a concert program. She had shown them. Little snatches of song bubbled up from her lips as she dressed. She thought she was looking very well. Excitement brought a faint, becoming pink into her round, creamy cheeks, quite drowning out her few freckles, and her hair gleamed with red-brown luster. Should she wear crab-apple blossoms in it, or her little fillet of pearls? After some agonized wavering, she decided on the crab-apple blossoms, and tucked the white waxen cluster behind her left ear. Now for a final look at her feet. Yes, both slippers were on. She gave the sleeping Jims a kiss—what a dear little warm, rosy, satin face he had—and hurried down the hill to the hall. Already it was filling. Soon it was crowded. Her concert was going to be a brilliant success. The first three numbers were successfully over. Rilla was in the little dressing-room behind the platform, looking out on the moonlit harbour and rehearsing her own recitations. She was alone, the rest of the performers being in the larger room on the other side. Suddenly she felt two soft bare arms slipping around her waist. Then Irene Howard dropped a light kiss on her cheek. "'Rilla, you sweet thing, you're looking simply angelic tonight. You have spunk. I thought you would feel so badly over Walter's enlisting that you'd hardly be able to bear up at all, and here you are, as cool as a cucumber. I wished I had half your nerve.' Rilla stood perfectly still. She felt no emotion whatever. She felt nothing. The world of feeling had just gone blank. "'Walter, enlisting,' she heard herself saying. Then she heard Irene's affected little laugh. "'Why didn't you know? I thought you did, of course, or I wouldn't have mentioned it. I am always putting my foot in it, aren't I? Yes, that is what he went to town for today. He told me coming out on the train tonight. I was the first person he told.' He isn't in khaki yet. They were out of uniforms, but he will be in a day or two. I always said Walter had as much pluck as anybody. I assure you I felt proud of him, Rilla, when he told me what he'd done. Oh, there's an end of Rick McAllister's reading. I must fly. I promised I'd play for the next chorus. Alice Clow has such a headache. She was gone. Oh, thank God she was gone. Rilla was alone again, staring out at the unchanged dream-like beauty of moonlit four winds. Feeling was coming back to her. A pang of agony so acute as to be almost physical seemed to rend her apart. "'I cannot bear it,' she said. And then came the awful thought that perhaps she could bear it, and that there might be years of this hideous suffering before her. She must get away. She must rush home. She must be alone. She could not go out there and play for drills and give readings and take part in dialogues now. It would spoil half the concert, but that did not matter. Nothing mattered. Was this she, Rilla Blythe, this tortured thing who had been quite happy a few minutes ago? Outside a quartet was singing, We'll never let the old flag fall. The music seemed to be coming from some remote distance. Why couldn't she cry, as she'd cried when Jem told them he must go? If she could cry, perhaps this horrible something that seemed to have seized on her very life might let go. But no tears came. Where were her scarf and coat? She must get away and hide herself like an animal hurt to the death. Was it a coward's part to run away like this? The question came to her suddenly, as if someone else had asked it. 
She thought of the shambles of the Flanders front. She thought of her brother and her playmate helping to hold those fire-swept trenches. What would they think of her if she shirked her little duty here, the humble duty of carrying the program through for her Red Cross? But she couldn't stay, she couldn't. Yet what was it Mother had said when Jem went? When our women fail in courage, shall our men be fearless still? But this, this was unbearable. Still, she stopped halfway to the door and went back to the window. Irene was singing now. Her beautiful voice, the only real thing about her, soared clear and sweet through the building. Rilla knew that the girl's fairy drill came next. Could she go out there and play for it? Her head was aching now. Her throat was burning. Oh, why had Irene told her just then, when telling could do no good? Irene had been very cruel. Rilla remembered now that more than once that day she had caught her mother looking at her with an odd expression. She had been too busy to wonder what it meant. She understood now. Mother had known why Walter went to town, but wouldn't tell her until the concert was over. What spirit and endurance Mother had! "'I must stay here and see things through,' said Rilla, clasping her cold hands together. The rest of the evening always seemed like a fevered dream to her. Her body was crowded by people, but her soul was alone in a torture chamber of its own. Yet she played steadily for the drills and gave her readings without faltering. She even put on a grotesque old Irish woman's costume and acted the part in the dialogue which Miranda Pryor had not taken. But she did not give her brogue the inimitable twist she had given it in the practices, and her readings lacked their usual fire and appeal. As she stood before the audience she saw one face only, that of the handsome, dark-haired lad sitting beside her mother. And she saw that same face in the trenches, saw it lying cold and dead under the stars, saw it pining in prison, saw the light of its eyes blotted out saw a hundred horrible things as she stood there on the beflagged platform of the Glen Hall, with her own face whiter than the milky crab-blossoms in her hair. Between her numbers she walked restlessly up and down the little dressing-room. Would the concert never end? It ended at last. Olive Kirk rushed up and told her exultantly that they had made a hundred dollars. "'That's good,' Rilla said mechanically. Then she was away from them all. Oh, thank God she was away from them all. Walter was waiting for her at the door. He put his arm through hers silently, and they went together down the moonlit road. The frogs were singing in the marshes, the dim and silvered fields of home lay all around them. The spring night was lovely and appealing. Rilla felt that its beauty was an insult to her pain. She would hate moonlight forever. "'You know?' said Walter. "'Yes. Irene told me,' answered Rilla chokingly. "'We didn't want you to know until the evening was over. I knew when you came out for the drill that you had heard.' "'Little sister, I had to do it. I couldn't live any longer on such terms with myself as I have been since the Lusitania was sunk. When I pictured those dead women and children floating about in that pitiless, ice-cold water, well, at first I just felt a sort of nausea with life. I wanted to get out of the world where such a thing could happen, shake its accursed dust from my feet forever. Then I knew I had to go. There are plenty without you. That isn't the point, Rilla, my Rilla. I'm going for my own sake.' to save my soul alive. It will shrink to something small and mean and lifeless if I don't go. That would be worse than blindness or mutilation or any of the things I've feared. You may be killed. Rilla hated herself for saying it. She knew it was a weak and cowardly thing to say, but she had rather gone to pieces after the tension of the evening. Comes he slow or comes he fast? It is but death who comes at last, quoted Walter. It's not death I fear. I told you that long ago. One can pay too high a price for mere life, little sister. There's so much hideousness in this war. I've got to go and help wipe it out of the world. I'm going to fight for the beauty of life, Rilla my Rilla. That is my duty. There may be a higher duty, perhaps. But that is mine. I owe life and Canada that, and I've got to pay it. Rilla, tonight, for the first time since Jem left, I've got back my self-respect. I could write poetry, Walter laughed. I've never been able to write a line since late August. Tonight I'm full of it. Little sister, be brave. You were so plucky when Jem left. This is d different. Rilla had to stop after every word to fight down a wild outburst of sobs. I loved Jem, of course, but when he went away, we thought the war would soon be over, and you are everything to me, Walter. You must be brave to help me, Rilla, my Rilla. I'm exalted tonight, drunk with the excitement of victory over myself. But there will be other times when it won't be like this. I'll need your help then. When do you go? She must know the worst at once. 
Not for a week. Then we go to Kingsport for training. I suppose we'll go overseas about the middle of July. We don't know. One week. Only one week more with Walter. The eyes of youth did not see how she was to go on living. When they turned in at the Ingleside gate, Walter stopped in the shadows of the old pines and drew Rilla close to him. Rilla, my Rilla, there were girls as sweet and pure as you in Belgium and Flanders. You, even you, know what their fate was. We must make it impossible for such things to happen again while the world lasts. You'll help me, won't you? I'll try, Walter, she said. Oh, I will try. As she clung to him with her face pressed against his shoulder, she knew that it had to be. She accepted the fact then and there. He must go. Her beautiful Walter with his beautiful soul and dreams and ideals. And she had known all along that it would come sooner or later. She had seen it coming to her. Coming. Coming. As one sees the shadow of a cloud drawing near over a sunny field, swiftly and inescapably. Amid all her pain she was conscious of an odd feeling of relief in some hidden part of her soul, where a little, dull, unacknowledged soreness had been lurking all winter. No one— no one could ever call Walter a slacker now. Rilla did not sleep that night. Perhaps no one at Ingleside did except Jims. The body grows slowly and steadily, but the soul grows by leaps and bounds. It may come to its full stature in an hour. From that night Rilla Blythe's soul was the soul of a woman in its capacity for suffering, for strength, for endurance. When the bitter dawn came she rose and went to her window. Below her was a big apple-tree, a great swelling cone of rosy blossom. Walter had planted it years ago when he was a little boy. Beyond Rainbow Valley there was a cloudy shore of morning with little ripples of sunrise breaking over it. The far, cold beauty of a lingering star shone above it. Why, in this world of springtime loveliness, must hearts break? Rilla felt arms go about her lovingly, protectingly. It was Mother. Pale, large-eyed Mother. "'Oh, Mother, how can you bear it?' she cried wildly. "'Rilla, dear!' I've known for several days that Walter meant to go. I've had time to—to to rebel and grow reconciled. We must give him up. There is a call greater and more insistent than the call of our love. He has listened to it. We must not add to the bitterness of his sacrifice. "'Our sacrifice is greater than his,' cried Rilla passionately. "'Our boys give only themselves. We give them.' Before Mrs. Blythe could reply, Susan stuck her head in at the door, never troubling over such frills of etiquette as knocking. Her eyes were suspiciously red, but all she said was, "'Will I bring up your breakfast, Mrs. Dr. Dear?' "'No, no, Susan. We will all be down presently. Do you know that Walter is joined up?' "'Yes, Mrs. Dr. Dear. The doctor told me last night. I suppose the Almighty has his own reasons for allowing such things. We must submit and endeavour to look on the bright side. It may cure him of being a poet, at least.' Susan still persisted in thinking that poets and tramps were tarred with the same brush. And that would be something. But thank God, she muttered in a lower tone, that Shirley is not old enough to go. Isn't that the same thing as thanking him that some other woman's son has to go in Shirley's place? asked the doctor, pausing on the threshold. No, it is not, doctor dear, said Susan defiantly, as she picked up Jims, who was opening his big dark eyes and stretching up his dimpled paws. Do not you put words in my mouth that I would never dream of uttering. I am a plain woman, and cannot argue with you, but I do not thank God that anybody has to go. I only know that it seems they do have to go, unless we all want to be kaiserized. For I can assure you that the Monroe Doctrine, whatever it is, is nothing to tie to, with Woodrow Wilson behind it. The Huns, Dr. Dear, will never be brought to Brook by notes. And now, concluded Susan, tucking Jims in the crook of her gaunt arms and marching downstairs, having cried my cry and said my say— I shall take a brace, and if I cannot look pleasant, I will look as pleasant as I can. End of chapter 14 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Karen Savage, Waco, Texas, June 2006 Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery Chapter 15 Until the Daybreak The Germans have recaptured Primusel said Susan despairingly, looking up from her newspaper. And now I suppose we will have to begin calling it by that uncivilized name again. Cousin Sophia was in when the mail came, and when she heard the news she hove a sigh up from the depths of her stomach, Mrs. Dr. Dear, and said, Ah, yes, and they will get Petrograd next, I have no doubt. I said to her, My knowledge of geography is not so profound as I wish it was, but I have an idea that it is quite a walk from Premisel to Petrograd. 
Cousin Sophia sighed again and said, "'The Grand Duke Nicholas is not the man I took him to be.' "'Do not let him know that,' said I. "'It might hurt his feelings, and he is likely enough to worry him as it is. "'But you cannot cheer Cousin Sophia up, no matter how sarcastic you are, Mrs. Dr. dear. "'She sighed for the third time, and groaned out, "'But the Russians are retreating fast,' and I said, "'Well, what of it? "'They have plenty of room for retreating, have they not? "'But all the same, Mrs. Dr. dear, though I would never admit it to Cousin Sophia, "'I do not like the situation on the Eastern Front.' "'Nobody else liked it, either.' But all summer the Russian retreat went on, a long, drawn-out agony. I wonder if I shall ever again be able to await the coming of the mail with feelings of composure, never to speak of pleasure, said Gertrude Oliver. The thought that haunts me night and day is, will the Germans smash Russia completely and then hurl their eastern army flushed with victory against the western front? They will not, Miss Oliver, dear, said Susan, assuming the role of prophetess. In the first place the Almighty will not allow it. In the second, Grand Duke Nicholas, though he may have been a disappointment to us in some respects, knows how to run away decently and in order, and that is a very useful knowledge when Germans are chasing you. Norman Douglas declares he is just luring them on and killing ten of them to one he loses. But I am of the opinion he cannot help himself, and is just doing the best he can under the circumstances, the same as the rest of us. So do not go so far afield to borrow trouble, Miss Oliver, dear, when there is plenty of it already camping on our very doorstep. Walter had gone to Kingsport the first of June. Nan, Di, and Faith had gone also to do Red Cross work in their vacation. In mid-July Walter came home for a week's leave before going overseas. Rilla had lived through the days of his absence on the hope of that week, and now that it had come she drank every minute of it thirstily, hating even the hours she had to spend in sleep. They seemed such a waste of precious moments. In spite of its sadness it was a beautiful week, full of poignant, unforgettable hours, when she and Walter had long walks and talks and silences together. He was all her own and she knew that he found strength and comfort in her sympathy and understanding. It was very wonderful to know she meant so much to him. The knowledge helped her through moments that would otherwise have been unendurable, and gave her power to smile, and even to laugh a little. When Walter had gone she might indulge in the comfort of tears, but not while he was here. She would not even let herself cry at night, lest her eyes should betray her to him in the morning. On his last evening at home they went together to Rainbow Valley and sat down on the bank of the brook under the White Lady, where the gay revels of olden days had been held in the cloudless years. Rainbow Valley was roofed over with a sunset of unusual splendor that night. A wonderful gray dusk, just touched with starlight, followed it. And then came moonshine, hinting, hiding, revealing, lighting up little dells and hollows here, leaving others in dark, velvet shadow. "'When I am somewhere in France—' said Walter, looking around him with eager eyes on all the beauty his soul loved. I shall remember these still, dewy, moon-drenched places, the balsam of the fir-trees, the peace of those white pools of moonshine, the strength of the hills. What a beautiful old biblical phrase that is! Rilla, look at those old hills around us, the hills we looked up at as children, wondering what lay for us in the great world beyond them. How calm and strong they are, how patient and changeless, like the heart of a good woman. "'Rilla, my Rilla, do you know what you have been to me the past year? "'I want to tell you before I go. "'I could not have lived through it if it had not been for you, "'little, loving, believing heart.' "'Rilla dared not try to speak. "'She slipped her hand into Walter's and pressed it hard. "'And when I'm over there, Rilla, in that hell upon earth "'which men who have forgotten God have made, "'it will be the thought of you that will help me most. "'I know you'll be as plucky and patient as you have shown yourself to be this past year. "'I'm not afraid for you.' I know that no matter what happens, you'll be Rilla, my Rilla, no matter what happens." Rilla repressed tear and sigh, but she could not repress a little shiver, and Walter knew that he had said enough. After a moment of silence, in which each made an unworded promise to each other, he said, "'Now we won't be sober any more. We'll look beyond the years, to the time when the war will be over, and Jem and Jerry and I will come marching home, and we'll all be happy again.' "'We won't be happy in the same way,' said Rilla. No, not in the same way. Nobody whom this war has touched will ever be happy again in quite the same way. But it will be a better happiness, I think, little sister. A happiness we've earned. We were very happy before the war, weren't we? With a home like Ingleside, and a father and mother like ours, we couldn't help being happy. But that happiness was a gift from life and love. It wasn't really ours. Life could take it back at any time. It can never take away the happiness we win for ourselves in the way of duty. I've realized that since I went into khaki. In spite of my occasional funks, when I fall to living over things beforehand, I've been happy since that night in May. Rilla, be awfully good to Mother while I'm away. 
It must be a horrible thing to be a mother in this war. The mothers and sisters and wives and sweethearts have the hardest times. Rilla, you beautiful little thing, are you anybody's sweetheart? If you are, tell me before I go. No, said Rilla. Then, impelled by a wish to be absolutely frank with Walter in this talk that might be the last they would ever have, she added, blushing wildly in the moonlight, But if Kenneth Ford wanted me to be— I see, said Walter. And Ken's in khaki, too. Poor little girly. It's a bit hard for you all round. Well, I'm not leaving any girl to break her heart about me, thank God for that. Rilla glanced up at the manse on the hill. She could see a light in Una Meredith's window. She felt tempted to say something, but she knew she must not. It was not her secret. And anyway, she did not know. She only suspected. Walter looked about him lingeringly and lovingly. This spot had always been so dear to him. What fun they all had had here, Lang Syne! Phantoms of memory seemed to pace the dappled paths and peep merrily through the swinging boughs. Jem and Jerry, bare-legged, sunburned schoolboys, fishing in the brook and frying trout over the old stone fireplace. Nan and Di and Faith in their dimpled, fresh-eyed, childish beauty. Una the sweet and shy. Carl poring over ants and bugs. Little slangy, sharp-tongued, good-hearted Mary Vance. The old Walter that had been himself lying on the grass reading poetry or wandering through palaces of fancy. They were all there around him. He could see them almost as plainly as he saw Rilla as plainly as he had once seen the Pied Piper piping down the valley in a vanishing twilight. And they said to him, those gay little ghosts of other days, We were the children of yesterday, Walter. Fight a good fight for the children of today and tomorrow. "'Where are you, Walter?' cried Rilla, laughing a little. "'Come back! Come back!' Walter came back with a long breath. He stood up and looked about him at the beautiful valley of moonlight, as if to impress on his mind and heart every charm it possessed. The great dark plumes of the firs against the silvery sky— the stately white lady, the old magic of the dancing brook, the faithful tree-lovers, the beckoning tricksy paths. "'I shall see it so in my dreams,' he said, as he turned away. They went back to Ingleside. Mr. and Mrs. Meredith were there, with Gertrude Oliver, who had come from Lowbridge to say good-bye. Everybody was quite cheerful and bright, but nobody said much about the war being soon over, as they had said when Jem went away. They did not talk about the war at all, and they thought of nothing else. At last they gathered around the piano and sang the grand old hymn. O God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy past, and our eternal home. We all come back to God in these days of soul-sifting, said Gertrude to John Meredith. There have been many days in the past when I didn't believe in God, not as God, only as the impersonal great first cause of the scientists. I believe in Him now. I have to. There's nothing else to fall back on but God, humbly, starkly, unconditionally. Our help in ages past. The same yesterday, today, and forever, said the minister gently. When we forget God, He remembers us. There was no crowd at the Glen Station the next morning to see Walter off. It was becoming commonplace for a khaki-clad boy to board that early morning train after his last leave. Besides his own, only the manse folk were there, and Mary Vance. Mary had sent her miller off the week before with a determined grin, and now considered herself entitled to give expert opinion on how such partings should be conducted. "'The main thing is to smile and act as if nothing was happening,' she informed the Ingleside group. "'The boys all hate the sob act like poison. Miller told me I wasn't to come near the station if I couldn't keep from bawling. So I got through with my crying beforehand, and at the last I said to him, "'Good luck, Miller, and if you come back you'll find I haven't changed any, and if you don't come back I'll always be proud you went, and in any case don't fall in love with a French girl.' Miller swore he wouldn't, but you never can tell about those fascinating foreign hussies. Anyhow, the last sight he had of me I was smiling to my limit. Gee, all the rest of the day my face felt as if it had been starched and ironed into a smile. In spite of Mary's advice and example, Mrs. Blythe, who had sent Jem off with a smile, could not quite manage one for Walter. But at least no one cried. Dog Monday came out of his lair in the shipping shed and sat down close to Walter, thumping his tail vigorously on the boards of the platform whenever Walter spoke to him, and looking up with confident eyes as if to say, "'I know you'll find Jem and bring him back to me.' "'So long, old fellow,' said Carl Meredith cheerfully, when the good-byes had to be said. "'Tell them over there to keep their spirits up. I'm coming along presently.' "'Me too.' said Shirley laconically, preferring a brown paw. Susan heard him, and her face turned very grey. 
Una shook hands quietly, looking at him with wistful, sorrowful, dark blue eyes. But then Una's eyes had always been wistful. Walter bent his handsome black head in its khaki cap and kissed her with the warm, comradely kiss of a brother. He had never kissed her before, and for a fleeting moment Una's face betrayed her if any one had noticed. But nobody did. The conductor was shouting, All aboard! Everybody was trying to look very cheerful. Walter turned to Rilla. She held his hands and looked up at him. She would not see him again until the day broke and the shadows vanished. And she knew not if that daybreak would be on this side of the grave or beyond it. Goodbye, she said. On her lips it lost all the bitterness it had won through the ages of parting, and bore instead all the sweetness of the old loves of all the women who had ever loved and prayed for the beloved. Write me often, and bring Jims up faithfully according to the Gospel of Morgan, Walter said lightly, having said all his serious things the night before in Rainbow Valley. But at the last moment he took her face between his hands and looked deep into her gallant eyes. God bless you, Rilla, my Rilla. He said softly and tenderly. After all, it was not a hard thing to fight for a land that bore daughters like this. He stood on the rear platform and waved to them as the train pulled out. Rilla was standing by herself, but Una Meredith came to her, and the two girls who loved him most stood together and held each other's cold hands as the train rounded the curve of the wooded hill. Rilla spent an hour in Rainbow Valley that morning, about which she never said a word to anyone. She did not even write in her diary about it. When it was over, she went home and made rompers for Jims. In the evening, she went to a junior Red Cross committee meeting and was severely businesslike. You would never suppose, said Irene Howard to Olive Kirk afterwards, that Walter had left for the front only this morning. But some people really have no depth of feeling. I often wish I could take things as lightly as Rilla Blythe. End of chapter 15. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Karen Savage, Waco, Texas, July 2006. Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 16 Realism and Romance. Warsaw has fallen, said Dr. Blythe with a resigned air as he brought the mail in one warm August day. Gertrude and Mrs. Blythe looked dismally at each other, and Rilla, who was feeding Jim's a morganized diet from a carefully sterilized spoon, laid the said spoon down on his tray utterly regardless of germs, and said, Oh, dear me! in as tragic a tone as if the news had come as a thunderbolt instead of being a foregone conclusion from the preceding week's dispatches. They had thought they were quite resigned to Warsaw's fall, but now they knew they had, as always, hoped against hope. "'Now let us take a brace,' said Susan. "'It is not the terrible thing we have been thinking. I read a dispatch three columns long in the Montreal Herald yesterday that proved that Warsaw was not important from a military point of view at all. So let us take the military point of view, Dr. dear.' I read that dispatch, too, and it has encouraged me immensely," said Gertrude. I knew then, and I knew now, that it was a lie from beginning to end. But I am in that state of mind where even a lie is a comfort, providing it is a cheerful lie. "'In that case, Miss Oliver, dear, the German official reports ought to be all you need,' said Susan sarcastically. I never read them now, because they make me so mad I cannot put my thoughts properly on my work after a dose of them. Even this news about Warsaw has taken the edge off my afternoon's plans. Misfortunes never come singly. I spoiled my baking of bread to-day, and now Warsaw has fallen, and here is little Kitchener bent on choking himself to death. Jims was evidently trying to swallow his spoon, germs and all. Rilla rescued him mechanically, and was about to resume the operation of feeding him, when a casual remark of her father's sent such a shock and thrill over her, that for the second time she dropped that doomed spoon. "'Kenneth Ford is down at Martin West's over harbour,' the doctor was saying. His regiment was on its way to the front, but was held up in Kingsport for some reason, and Ken got leave of absence to come over to the island. "'I hope he will come up to see us,' exclaimed Mrs. Blythe. "'He only has a day or two off, I believe,' said the doctor absently. Nobody noticed Rilla's flushed face and trembling hands. Even the most thoughtful and watchful of parents do not see everything that goes on under their very noses. Rilla made a third attempt to give the long-suffering Jims his dinner, but all she could think of was the question, would Ken come to see her before he went away? She had not heard from him for a long while. Had he forgotten her completely? If he did not come, she would know that he had. Perhaps there was even some other girl back there in Toronto. Of course there was. She was a little fool to be thinking about him at all. She would not think about him. If he came, well and good. It would only be courteous of him to make a farewell call at Ingleside, where he had often been a guest. If he did not come, well and good, too. It did not matter very much. Nobody was going to fret. That was all settled comfortably. She was quite indifferent. But meanwhile Jims was being fed with a haste and recklessness that would have filled the soul of Morgan with horror. Jims himself didn't like it, being a methodical baby accustomed to swallowing spoonfuls with a decent interval for breath between each. He protested, but his protests availed him nothing. Rilla, as far as the care and feeding of infants was concerned, was utterly demoralized. 
Then the telephone bell rang. There was nothing unusual about the telephone ringing. It rang on an average every ten minutes at Ingleside. But Rilla dropped Jim's spoon again—on the carpet this time—and flew to the phone as if life depended on her getting there before anybody else. Jim's, his patience exhausted, lifted up his voice and wept. "'Hello, is this Ingleside?' "'Yes.' "'That you, Rilla?' "'Yes, yes! Oh, why couldn't Jim stop howling for just one little minute? Why didn't somebody come in and choke him? Know who's speaking? Oh, didn't she know? Wouldn't she know that voice anywhere, at any time? It's ten, isn't it? Sure thing. I'm here for a look in. Can I come up to Ingleside tonight and see you? Of course. Had he used you in the singular or plural sense? Presently she would wring Jim's neck. Oh, what was Ken saying? See here, Rilla. Can you arrange that there won't be more than a few dozen people around? Understand? I can't make my meaning clearer over this bally rural line. There are a dozen receivers down. Did she understand? Yes, she understood. I'll try, she said. I'll be up about eight, then. Bye-bye. Rilla hung up the phone and flew to Jim's. But she did not wring that injured infant's neck. Instead, she snatched him bodily out of his chair, crushed him against her face, kissed him rapturously on his milky mouth, and danced wildly around the room with him in her arms. After this, Jims was relieved to find that she returned to sanity, gave him the rest of his dinner properly, and tucked him away for his afternoon nap with the little lullaby he loved best of all. She sewed at Red Cross shirts for the rest of the afternoon, and built a crystal castle of dreams, all a-quiver with rainbows. Ken wanted to see her—to see her alone. That could be easily managed. Shirley wouldn't bother them. Father and Mother were going to the manse, Miss Oliver never played gooseberry, and Jims always slept the clock round from seven to seven. She would entertain Ken on the veranda. It would be moonlight. She would wear her white georgette dress and do her hair up. Yes, she would. At least in a low knot at the nape of her neck. Mother couldn't object to that, surely. Oh, how wonderful and romantic it would be! Would Ken say anything? He must mean to say something, or why should he be so particular about seeing her alone? What if it rained? Susan had been complaining about Mr. Hyde that morning. What if some officious junior red called to discuss Belgians and shirts? Or, worst of all, what if Fred Arnold dropped in? He did occasionally. The evening came at last, and was all that could be desired in an evening. The doctor and his wife went to the manse. Shirley and Miss Oliver went they alone knew where. Susan went to the store for household supplies, and Jims went to Dreamland. Rilla put on her georgette gown, knotted up her hair, and bound a little double string of pearls around it. Then she tucked a cluster of pale pink baby roses at her belt. Would Ken ask her for a rose for a keepsake? She knew that Jem had carried to the trenches in Flanders a faded rose that Faith Meredith had kissed and given him the night before he left. Rilla looked very sweet when she met Ken in the mingled moonlight and vine shadows of the big veranda. The hand she gave him was cold, and she was so desperately anxious not to lisp that her greeting was prim and precise. How handsome and tall Kenneth looked in his lieutenant's uniform! It made him seem older, too, so much so that Rilla felt rather foolish. Hadn't it been the height of absurdity for her to suppose that this splendid young officer had anything special to say to her, little Rilla Blythe of Glen St. Mary? Likely she hadn't understood him after all. He had only meant that he didn't want a mob of folks around making a fuss over him and trying to lionize him, as they had probably done over Harbour. Yes, of course, that was all he meant. And she, little idiot, had gone and vainly imagined that he didn't want anybody but her. And he would think she had manoeuvred everybody away so that they could be alone together, and he would laugh to himself at her. "'This is better luck than I hoped for,' said Ken, leaning back in his chair and looking at her with very unconcealed admiration in his eloquent eyes. I was sure someone would be hanging about, and it was just you I wanted to see, Rilla, my Rilla." Rilla's dream-castle flashed into the landscape again. This was unmistakable enough, certainly. Not much doubt as to his meaning here. "'There aren't so many of us to poke around as there used to be,' she said softly. "'No, that's so,' said Ken, gently. "'Jem and Walter and the girls away. It makes a big blank, doesn't it? But—he leaned forward until his dark curls almost brushed her hair. Doesn't Fred Arnold try to fill the blank occasionally? I have been told so." At this moment, before Rilla could make any reply, Jims began to cry at the top of his voice in the room whose open window was just above them. Jims, who hardly ever cried in the evening. Moreover, he was crying, as Rilla knew from experience, with a vim and energy that betokened that he had already been whimpering softly unheard for some time, and was thoroughly exasperated. When Jim started in crying like that, he made a thorough job of it. Rilla knew that there was no use to sit still and pretend to ignore him. He wouldn't stop, and conversation of any kind was out of the question when such shrieks and howls were floating over your head. Besides, she was afraid Kenneth would think she was utterly unfeeling if she sat still and let a baby cry like that. He was not likely acquainted with Morgan's invaluable volume. She got up. "'Jims has had a nightmare, I think. He sometimes has one, and he is always badly frightened by it. Excuse me for a moment.' 
Rilla flew upstairs, wishing quite frankly that soup tureens had never been invented. But when Jims, at the sight of her, lifted his little arms entreatingly and swallowed several sobs, with tears rolling down his cheeks, resentment went out of her heart. After all, the poor darling was frightened. She picked him up gently and rocked him soothingly until his sobs ceased and his eyes closed. Then she essayed to lay him down in his crib. Jims opened his eyes and shrieked a protest. This performance was repeated twice. Rilla grew desperate. She couldn't leave Ken down there alone any longer. She had been away nearly half an hour already. With a resigned air she marched downstairs, carrying Jims, and sat down on the veranda. It was no doubt a ridiculous thing to sit and cuddle a contrary war-baby when your best young man was making his farewell call. But there was nothing else to be done. Jims was supremely happy. He kicked his little pink-soled feet rapturously out under his white nighty and gave one of his rare laughs. He was beginning to be a very pretty baby. His golden hair curled in silken ringlets all over his little round head, and his eyes were beautiful. "'He's a decorative kitty, all right, isn't he?' said Ken. "'His looks are all very well,' said Rilla bitterly, as if to imply that they were much the best of him. Jims, being an astute infant, sensed trouble in the atmosphere, and realized that it was up to him to clear it away. He turned his face up to Rilla, smiled adorably, and said clearly and beguilingly, "'Well, well!' It was the very first time he had spoken a word or tried to speak. Rilla was so delighted that she forgot her grudge against him. She forgave him with a hug and a kiss. Jims, understanding that he was restored to favour, cuddled down against her just where a gleam of light from the lamp in the living-room struck across his hair, and turned it into a halo of gold against her breast. Kenneth sat very still and silent, looking at Rilla, at the delicate girlish silhouette of her, her long lashes, her dented lip, her adorable chin. In the dim moonlight, as she sat with her head bent a little over Jims, the lamplight glinting on her pearls until they glistened like a slender nimbus, he thought she looked exactly like the Madonna that hung over his mother's desk at home. He carried that picture of her in his heart to the horror of the battlefields of France. He had had a strong fancy for Rilla ever since the night of the Four Winds dance. But it was when he saw her there, with little Jims in her arms, that he loved her and realized it. And all the while poor Rilla was sitting disappointed and humiliated, feeling that her last evening with Ken was spoiled, and wondering why things always had to go so contrarily outside of books. She felt too absurd to try to talk. Evidently Ken was completely disgusted, too, since he was sitting there in such stony silence. Hope revived momentarily when Jims went so thoroughly asleep that she thought it would be safe to lay him down on the couch in the living-room. But when she came out again, Susan was sitting on the veranda, loosening her bonnet-strings with the air of one who meant to stay where she was for some time. "'Have you got your baby to sleep?' she asked kindly. "'Your baby. Really. Susan might have more tact.' "'Yes,' said Rilla shortly. Susan laid her parcels on the reed-table, as one determined to do her duty. She was very tired, but she must help Rilla out. Here was Kenneth Ford, who had come to call on the family, and they were all unfortunately out, and the poor child had had to entertain him alone. But Susan had come to her rescue. Susan would do her part, no matter how tired she was. "'Dear me, how you have grown up,' she said, looking at Ken's six feet of khaki uniform without the least awe. Susan had grown used to khaki now, and at sixty-four even a lieutenant's uniform was just clothes and nothing else. It is an amazing thing how fast children do grow up. Rilla here now is almost fifteen. "'I'm going on seventeen, Susan,' cried Rilla almost passionately. She was a whole month past sixteen. It was intolerable of Susan. "'It seems just the other day that you were all babies,' said Susan, ignoring Rilla's protest. "'You were really the prettiest baby I ever saw, Ken, though your mother had an awful time trying to cure you of sucking your thumb. Do you remember the day I spanked you?' "'No,' said Ken. "'Oh, well, I suppose you would be too young. You were only about four, and you were here with your mother, and you insisted on teasing Nan until she cried.' I had tried several ways of stopping you, but none availed, and I saw that a spanking was the only thing that would serve. So I picked you up and laid you across my knee and lambasted you well. You howled at the top of your voice, but you left Nan alone after that." Rilla was writhing. Hadn't Susan any realization that she was addressing an officer of the Canadian Army? Apparently she had not. Oh, what would Ken think? I suppose you do not remember the time your mother spanked you, either," continued Susan, who seemed to be bent on reviving tender reminiscences that evening. I shall never, no, never forget it. She was up here one night with you when you were about three, and you and Walter were playing out in the kitchen yard with a kitten. I had a big puncheon of rainwater by the spout, which I was reserving for making soap, and you and Walter began quarrelling over the kitten. Walter was at one side of the puncheon, standing on a chair, holding the kitten, and you were standing on a chair at the other side. You leaned across that puncheon, grabbed the kitten, and pulled. You were always a great hand for taking what you wanted without too much ceremony. Walter held on tight, and the poor kitten yelled, but you dragged Walter and the kitten half over, and then you both lost your balance and tumbled into that puncheon, kitten and all. If I had not been on the spot, you would both have been drowned. 
I flew to the rescue and hauled you all three out before much harm was done, and your mother, who had seen it all from the upstairs window, came down and picked you up, dripping as you were, and gave you a beautiful spanking. Ah, said Susan with a sigh, those were happy old days at Ingleside. Must have been, said Ken. His voice sounded queer and stiff. Rilla was supposed he was hopelessly enraged. The truth was he dared not trust his voice lest it betray his frantic desire to laugh. Rilla here now, said Susan, looking affectionately at that unhappy damsel. Never was much spanked. She was a real well-behaved child for the most part. But her father did spank her once. She got two bottles of pills out of his office, and dared Alice Clow to see which of them could swallow all the pills first. And if her father had not happened in the nick of time, those two children would have been corpses by night. As it was, they were both sick enough shortly after. But the doctor spanked Rilla then and there, and he made such a thorough job of it that she never meddled with anything in his office afterwards. We hear a great deal nowadays of something that is called moral persuasion, but in my opinion a good spanking and no nagging afterwards is a much better thing. Rilla wondered viciously whether Susan meant to relate all the family spankings. But Susan had finished with the subject and branched off to another cheerful one. I remember little Todd McAllister over harbour killed himself that very way, eating up a whole box of fruitatives because he thought they were candy. It was a very sad affair. He was, said Susan earnestly, the very cutest little corpse I ever laid my eyes on. It was very careless of his mother to leave the fruitatives where he could get them. But she was well known to be a heedless creature. One day she found a nest of five eggs as she was going across the fields to church with a brand new silk dress on. So she put them in the pocket of her petticoat, and when she got to church she forgot all about them and sat down on them, and her dress was ruined, not to speak of the petticoat. Let me see. Would not Todd be some relation of yours? Your great-grandmother West was a McAllister. Her brother Amos was a Macdonaldite in religion. I am told he used to take the jerks something fearful. But you look more like your great-grandfather West than the McAllisters. He died of a paralytic stroke quite early in life. "'Did you see anybody at the store?' asked Rilla desperately, in the faint hope of directing Susan's conversation into more agreeable channels. "'Nobody except Mary Vance,' said Susan, and she was stepping around as brisk as the Irishman's flea. What terrible similes Susan used! Would Kenneth think she acquired them from the family? "'To hear Mary talk about Miller Douglas you would think she was the only Glen boy who had enlisted,' Susan went on. "'But of course she always did brag, and she has some good qualities, I am willing to admit.' though I did not think so that time she chased Rilla here through the village with a dried codfish till the poor child fell heels over head into the puddle before Carter Flagg's store. Rilla went cold all over with wrath and shame. Were there any more disgraceful scenes in her past that Susan could rake up? As for Ken, he could have howled over Susan's speeches, but he would not so insult the duenna of his lady, so he sat with a preternaturally solemn face which seemed to poor Rilla a haughty and offended one. "'I paid eleven cents for a bottle of ink tonight,' complained Susan. Ink is twice as high as it was last year. Perhaps it is because Woodrow Wilson has been writing so many notes. It must cost him considerable. My cousin Sophia says Woodrow Wilson is not the man she expected him to be. But then, no man ever was. Being an old maid, I do not know much about men, and have never pretended to. But my cousin Sophia is very hard on them, although she married two of them, which you might think was a fair share. Albert Crawford's chimney blew down in that big gale we had last week, and when Sophia heard the bricks clattering on the roof she thought it was a Zeppelin raid and went into hysterics and Mrs. Albert Crawford says that of the two things she would have preferred the Zeppelin raid. Rilla sat limply in her chair like one hypnotized. She knew Susan would stop talking when she was ready to stop, and that no earthly power could make her stop any sooner. As a rule she was very fond of Susan, but just now she hated her with a deadly hatred. It was ten o'clock. Ken would soon have to go. The others would soon be home. And she had not even had a chance to explain to Ken that Fred Arnold filled no blank in her life, nor ever could. Her rainbow castle lay in ruins around her. Kenneth got up at last. He realized that Susan was there to stay as long as he did, and it was a three-mile walk to Martin West's over harbour. He wondered if Rilla had put Susan up to this, not wanting to be left alone with him, lest he say something Fred Arnold's sweetheart did not want to hear. Rilla got up, too, and walked silently the length of the veranda with him. They stood there for a moment, Ken on the lower step. The step was half sunk into the earth, and mint grew thickly about it over its edge. Often crushed by so many passing feet, it gave out its essence freely, and the spicy odour hung round them like a soundless, invisible benediction. Ken looked up at Rilla, whose hair was shining in the moonlight and whose eyes were pools of allurement. All at once he felt sure there was nothing in that gossip about Fred Arnold. "'Rilla,' he said in a sudden, intense whisper, "'you are the sweetest thing.' Rilla flushed and looked at Susan. Ken looked, too, and saw that Susan's back was turned. He put his arm about Rilla and kissed her. It was the first time Rilla had ever been kissed. She thought perhaps she ought to resent it, but she didn't. Instead, she glanced timidly into Kenneth's seeking eyes, and her glance was a kiss. "'Rilla, my Rilla,' said Ken, 
"'Will you promise me that you won't let anyone else kiss you until I come back?' "'Yes,' said Rilla, trembling and thrilling. Susan was turning round. Ken loosened his hold and stepped to the walk. "'Good-bye,' he said casually. Rilla heard herself saying it just as casually. She stood and watched him down the walk, out of the gate, and down the road. When the fir wood hid him from her sight, she suddenly said, "'Oh!' in a choked way, and ran down to the gate, sweet, blossomy things catching at her skirts as she ran. Leaning over the gate, she saw Kenneth walking briskly down the road, over the bars of tree shadows and moonlight, his tall, erect figure grey in the white radiance. As he reached the turn, he stopped and looked back, and saw her standing amid the tall white lilies by the gate. He waved his hand. She waved hers. He was gone round the turn. Rilla stood there for a little while, gazing across the fields of mist and silver. She had heard her mother say that she loved turns in the roads. They were so provocative and alluring. Rilla thought she hated them. She had seen Jem and Jerry vanish from her round a bend in the road. Then Walter, and now Ken. Brothers and playmate and sweetheart. They were all gone. Never, it might be, to return. Yet still the piper piped and the dance of death went on. When Rilla walked slowly back to the house, Susan was still sitting by the veranda table, and Susan was sniffing suspiciously. "'I have been thinking, Rilla dear, of the old days in the House of Dreams, when Kenneth's mother and father were courting, and Jem was a little baby and you were not born or thought of. It was a very romantic affair, and she and your mother were such chums. To think I should have lived to see her son going to the front, as if she had not had enough trouble in her early life without this coming upon her. But we must take a brace and see it through.' All Rilla's anger against Susan had evaporated. With Ken's kiss still burning on her lips, and the wonderful significance of the promise he had asked thrilling heart and soul, she could not be angry with anyone. She put her slim white hand into Susan's brown work-hardened one, and gave it a squeeze. Susan was a faithful old dear, and would lay down her life for any one of them. "'You are tired, Rilla dear, and had better go to bed,' Susan said, patting her hand. "'I noticed you were too tired to talk tonight. I am glad I came home in time to help you out.' It is very tiresome trying to entertain young men when you are not accustomed to it. Rilla carried Jims upstairs and went to bed, but not before she had sat for a long time at her window reconstructing her rainbow castle with several added domes and turrets. I wonder, she said to herself, if I am or am not engaged to Kenneth Ford. End of chapter 16 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Karen Savage, Waco, Texas, July 2006. Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 17 The Weeks Wear By. Rilla read her first love letter in her Rainbow Valley fir shadowed nook, and a girl's first love letter, whatever blase older people may think of it, is an event of tremendous importance in the teens. After Kenneth's regiment had left Kingsport there came a fortnight of dully aching anxiety, and when the congregation sang in church on Sunday evenings, Oh, hear us when we cry to thee for those in peril on the sea. Rilla's voice always failed her, for with the words came a horribly vivid mind-picture of a submarine ship sinking beneath pitiless waves and amid the struggles and cries of drowning men. Then word came that Kenneth's regiment had arrived safely in England, and now, at last, here was his letter. It began with something that made Rilla supremely happy for the moment, and ended with a paragraph that crimsoned her cheeks with the wonder and thrill and delight of it. Between beginning and ending the letter was just such a jolly, newsy epistle as Ken might have written to anyone. But for the sake of that beginning and ending, Rilla slept with the letter under her pillow for weeks, sometimes waking in the night to slip her fingers under and just touch it and looked with secret pity on other girls whose sweethearts could never have written them anything half so wonderful and exquisite. Kenneth was not the son of a famous novelist for nothing. He had a way of expressing things in a few poignant, significant words that seemed to suggest far more than they uttered, and never grew stale or flat or foolish with ever so many scores of readings. Rilla went home from Rainbow Valley as if she flew rather than walked. But such moments of uplift were rare that autumn. To be sure, there was one day in September when great news came of a big Allied victory in the West, and Susan ran out to hoist the flag—the first time she had hoisted it since the Russian line broke, and the last time she was to hoist it for many dismal months. "'Likely the big push has begun at last, Mrs. Dr. dear,' she exclaimed. "'And we will soon see the finish of the Huns. Our boys will be home by Christmas now. Hurrah!' Susan was ashamed of herself for hurrahing the minute she had done it, and apologized meekly for such an outburst of juvenility. 
But indeed, Mrs. Dr. dear, this good news has gone to my head after this awful summer of Russian slumps and Gallipoli setbacks. Good news, said Miss Oliver bitterly. I wonder if the women whose men have been killed for it will call it good news. Just because our own men are not on that part of the front, we are rejoicing as if the victory had cost no lives. Now, Miss Oliver, dear, do not take that view of it, deprecated Susan. We have not had much to rejoice over of late, and yet men were being killed just the same. Do not let yourself slump like poor cousin Sophia. She said when the word came, Ah, it is nothing but a rift in the clouds. We are up this week, but we will be down the next. Well, Sophia Crawford, said I, for I will never give in to her, Mrs. Dr. dear. God himself cannot make two hills without a hollow between them, as I have heard it said. But that is no reason why we should not take the good of the hills when we are on them. But cousin Sophia moaned on. Here is the Gallipoli expedition, a failure, and the Grand Duke Nicholas sent off, and every one knows the Tsar of Russia is a pro-German, and the Allies have no ammunition, and Bulgaria is going against us, and the end is not yet, for England and France must be punished for their deadly sins until they repent in sackcloth and ashes. I think myself, I said, that they will do their repenting in khaki and trench mud, and it seems to me that the Huns should have a few sins to repent of also. They are instruments in the hands of the Almighty to purge the garner, said Sophia. And then I got mad, Mrs. Dr. dear, and told her I did not and never would believe that the Almighty ever took such dirty instruments in hand for any purpose whatever, and that I did not consider it decent for her to be using the words of Holy Writ as glibly as she was doing in ordinary conversation. She was not, I told her, a minister or even an elder. And for the time being I squelched her, Mrs. Dr. dear. Cousin Sophia has no spirit. She is very different from her niece, Mrs. Dean Crawford, over harbour. You know the Dean Crawfords had five boys, and now the new baby is another boy. All the connection, and especially Dean Crawford, were much disappointed, because their hearts had been set on a girl. But Mrs. Dean just laughed and said, Everywhere I went this summer I saw the sign, Men Wanted, staring me in the face. Do you think I could go and have a girl under such circumstances? There is spirit for you, Mrs. Dr. dear. But Cousin Sophia would say the child was just so much more cannon fodder. Cousin Sophia had full range for her pessimism that gloomy autumn, and even Susan, incorrigible old optimist as she was, was hard put to it for cheer. When Bulgaria lined up with Germany, Susan only remarked scornfully, "'One more nation anxious for a licking!' But the Greek tangle worried her beyond her powers of philosophy to endure calmly. Constantine of Greece has a German wife, Mrs. Dr. dear, and that fact squelches hope. To think that I should have lived to care what kind of a wife Constantine of Greece had— the miserable creature is under his wife's thumb, and that is a bad place for any man to be. I am an old maid, and an old maid has to be independent or she will be squashed out. But if I had been a married woman, Mrs. Dr. dear, I would have been meek and humble. It is my opinion that this Sophia of Greece is a minx. Susan was furious when the news came that Venizelos had met with defeat. I could spank Constantine and skin him alive afterwards, that I could, she exclaimed bitterly. "'Oh, Susan, I am surprised at you,' said the doctor, pulling a long face. "'Have you no regard for the proprieties? Skin him alive by all means, but omit the spanking.' "'If he had been well spanked in his younger days, he might have more sense now,' retorted Susan. "'But I suppose princes are never spanked, more is the pity. "'I see the Allies have sent him an ultimatum. "'I could tell them that it will take more than ultimatums to skin the snake like Constantine. "'Perhaps the Allied blockade will hammer sense into his head.' But that will take some time, I am thinking. And in the meantime, what is to become of poor Serbia? They saw what became of Serbia, and during the process Susan was hardly to be lived with. In her exasperation she abused everything and everybody except Kitchener, and she fell upon poor President Wilson, tooth and claw. If he had done his duty and gone into the war long ago, we should not have seen this mess in Serbia, she avowed. It would be a serious thing to plunge a great country like the United States, with its mixed population, into the war, Susan, said the doctor, who sometimes came to the defence of the President, not because he thought Wilson needed it especially, but from an unholy love of baiting Susan. Maybe, doctor dear, maybe. But that makes me think of the old story of the girl who told her grandmother she was going to be married. It is a solemn thing to be married, said the old lady. Yes, but it is a solemner thing not to be, said the girl, and I can testify to that out of my own experience, Dr. dear. and I think it is a solemner thing for the Yankees that they have kept out of the war than it would have been if they had gone into it. However, though I do not know much about them, I am of the opinion that we will see them starting something yet, Woodrow Wilson or no Woodrow Wilson, when they get it into their heads that this war is not a correspondence school. They will not— 
said Susan, energetically waving a saucepan with one hand and a soup ladle with the other, be too proud to fight then. On a pale yellow windy evening in October, Carl Meredith went away. He had enlisted on his eighteenth birthday. John Meredith saw him off with a set face. His two boys were gone. There was only little Bruce left now. He loved Bruce and Bruce's mother dearly, but Jerry and Carl were the sons of the bride of his youth, and Carl was the only one of all his children who had Cecilia's very eyes. As they looked lovingly out at him above Carl's uniform, the pale minister suddenly remembered the day when, for the first and last time, he had tried to whip Carl for his prank with the eel. That was the first time he had realized how much Carl's eyes were like Cecilia's. Now he realized it again once more. Would he ever again see his dead wife's eyes looking at him from his son's face? What a bonny, clean, handsome lad he was! It was hard to see him go. John Meredith seemed to be looking at a torn plain strewed with the bodies of able bodied men between the ages of eighteen and forty five. Only the other day Carl had been a little scrap of a boy, hunting bugs in Rainbow Valley, taking lizards to bed with him, and scandalizing the Glen by carrying frogs to Sunday school. It seemed hardly right, somehow, that he should be an able bodied man in khaki. Yet John Meredith had said no word to dissuade him when Carl had told him he must go. Rilla felt Carl's going keenly. They had always been cronies and playmates. He was only a little older than she was, and they had been children in Rainbow Valley together. She recalled all their old pranks and escapades as she walked slowly home alone. The full moon peeped through the scudding clouds with sudden floods of weird illumination. The telephone wires sang a shrill, weird song in the wind, and the tall spikes of withered, gray headed goldenrod in the fence corner swayed and beckoned wildly to her like groups of old witches weaving unholy spells. On such a night as this, long ago, Carl would come over to Ingleside and whistle her out to the gate. Let's go on a moon spree, Rilla, he would say, and the two of them would scamper off to Rainbow Valley. Rilla had never been afraid of his beetles and bugs, though she drew a hard and fast line at snakes. They used to talk together of almost everything, and were teased about each other at school. But one evening, when they were about ten years of age, they had solemnly promised by the old spring in Rainbow Valley that they would never marry each other. Alice Clow had crossed out their names on her slate in school that day, and it came out that both married. They did not like the idea at all, hence the mutual vow in Rainbow Valley. There was nothing like an ounce of prevention. Rilla laughed over the old memory, and then sighed. That very day a dispatch from some London paper had contained the cheerful announcement that the present moment is the darkest since the war began. It was dark enough, and Rilla wished desperately that she could do something besides waiting and serving at home, as day after day the Glen boys she had known went away. If she were only a boy, speeding in khaki by Carl's side to the western front! She had wished that in a burst of romance when Jem had gone, without perhaps really meaning it. She meant it now. There were moments when waiting at home, in safety and comfort, seemed an unendurable thing. The moon burst triumphantly through an especially dark cloud, and shadow and silver chased each other in waves over the glen. Rilla remembered one moonlit evening of childhood when she had said to her mother, The moon just looks like a sorry, sorry face. She thought it looked like that still. An agonized, careworn face, as though it looked down on dreadful sights. What did it see on the western front? In broken Serbia? On shell swept Gallipoli? I am tired, Miss Oliver had said that day, in a rare outburst of impatience, of this horrible rack of strained emotions, when every day brings a new horror or the dread of it. No, don't look reproachfully at me, Mrs. Blythe. There's nothing heroic about me today. I've slumped. I wish England had left Belgium to her fate. I wish Canada had never sent a man. I wish we'd tied our boys to our apron strings and not let one of them go. Oh, I shall be ashamed of myself in half an hour. But at this very minute I mean every word of it. Will the Allies never strike? Patience is a tired mare, but she jogs on, said Susan. While the steeds of Armageddon thunder trampling over our hearts, retorted Miss Oliver. Susan, tell me, don't you ever, didn't you ever take spells of feeling that you must scream or swear or smash something just because your torture reaches a point when it becomes unbearable? I have never sworn or desired to swear, Miss Oliver, dear. But I will admit, said Susan, with the air of one determined to make a clean breast of it once and for all, that I have experienced occasions when it was a relief to do considerable banging. Don't you think that is a kind of swearing, Susan? What is the difference between slamming a door viciously and saying, D Miss Oliver, dear, interrupted Susan, desperately determined to save Gertrude from herself if human power could do it. You are all tired out and unstrung, and no wonder, teaching those obstreperous youngsters all day and coming home to bad war news. 
"'But just you go upstairs and lie down, and I will bring you up a cup of hot tea and a bite of toast, and very soon you will not want to slam doors or swear. Susan, you're a good soul. A very pearl of Susan's. But Susan, it would be such a relief to just say one soft, low, little, tiny d— "'I will bring you a hot water bottle for the soles of your feet also,' interposed Susan resolutely, "'and it would not be any relief to say that word you are thinking of, Miss Oliver, and that you may tie to.' "'Well, I'll try the hot-water bottle first, said Miss Oliver, repenting herself on teasing Susan and vanishing upstairs, to Susan's intense relief. Susan shook her head ominously as she filled the hot-water bottle. The war was certainly relaxing the standards of behaviour woefully. Here was Miss Oliver admittedly on the point of profanity. "'We must draw the blood from her brain,' said Susan, "'and if this bottle is not affected I will see what can be done with a mustard-plaster.' Gertrude rallied and carried on. Lord Kitchener went to Greece, whereat Susan foretold that Constantine would soon experience a change of heart. Lloyd George began to heckle the Allies regarding equipment and guns, and Susan said you would hear more of Lloyd George yet. The gallant Anzacs withdrew from Gallipoli, and Susan approved the step, with reservations. The siege of Catalamara began, and Susan pored over maps of Mesopotamia and abused the Turks. Henry Ford started for Europe, and Susan flayed him with sarcasm. Sir John French was superseded by Sir Douglas Haig, and Susan dubiously opined that it was poor policy to swap horses crossing a stream, though to be sure Haig was a good name, and French had a foreign sound, say what you might. Not a move on the great chessboard of king or bishop or pawn escaped Susan, who had once read only Glen's and Mary notes. "'There was a time,' she said sorrowfully, "'when I did not care what happened outside of P.E. Island, and now a king cannot have a toothache in Russia or China, but it worries me.' It may be broadening to the mind, as the doctor said, but it is very painful to the feelings. When Christmas came again, Susan did not set any vacant places at the festive board. Two empty chairs were too much even for Susan, who had thought in September that there would not be one. "'This is the first Christmas that Walter was not home,' Rilla wrote in her diary that night. Jem used to be away for Christmases up in Avonlea, but Walter never was. I had letters from Ken and him today. They are still in England, but expect to be in the trenches very soon. And then—but I suppose we'll be able to endure it somehow. To me the strangest of all the strange things since 1914 is how we have all learned to accept things we never thought we could, to go on with life as a matter of course. I know that Jem and Jerry are in the trenches, that Ken and Walter will be soon, that if one of them does not come back my heart will break, yet I go on and work and plan, yes, and even enjoy life by times. There are moments when we have real fun, because— just for the moment we don't think about things, and then we remember, and the remembering is worse than thinking of it all the time would have been. Today was dark and cloudy, and tonight is wild enough, as Gertrude says, to please any novelist in search of a suitable matter for a murder or elopement. The raindrops streaming over the panes look like tears running down a face, and the wind is shrieking through the maple grove. This hasn't been a nice Christmas day in any way. Nan had toothache, and Susan had red eyes, and assumed a weird and gruesome flippancy of manner to deceive us into thinking she hadn't. And Jim's had a bad cold all day, and I'm afraid of croup. He has had croup twice since October. The first time I was nearly frightened to death, for father and mother were both away. Father always is away, it seems to me, when any of his household gets sick. But Susan was cool as a fish and knew just what to do, and by morning Jim's was all right. That child is a cross between a duck and an imp. He's a year and four months old, trots about everywhere, and says quite a few words. He has the cutest little way of calling me Willa Will. It always brings back that dreadful, ridiculous, delightful night when Ken came to say good-bye, and I was so furious and happy. Jim's is pink and white and big-eyed and curly-haired, and every now and then I discover a new dimple in him. I can never quite believe he is really the same creature as that scrawny, yellow, ugly little changeling I brought home in the soup tureen. Nobody has ever heard a word from Jim Anderson. If he never comes back, I shall keep Jim's always. Everybody here worships and spoils him, or would spoil him, if Morgan and I didn't stand remorselessly in the way. Susan says Jim's is the cleverest child she ever saw, and can recognize old Nick when he sees him. This because Jim's threw poor Doc out of an upstairs window one day. Doc turned into Mr. Hyde on his way down and landed in a currant bush, spitting and swearing. I tried to console his inner cat with a saucer of milk, but he would have none of it, and remained Mr. Hyde the rest of the day. Jim's latest exploit was to paint the cushion of the big armchair in the sun parlour with molasses, and before anybody found it out, Mrs. Fred Clow came in on Red Cross business and sat down on it. Her new silk dress was ruined, and nobody could blame her for being vexed. 
but she went into one of her tempers and said nasty things and gave me such slams about spoiling Jims that I nearly boiled over too. But I kept the lid on till she had waddled away and then I exploded. The fat, clumsy, horrid old thing, I said, and oh, what a satisfaction it was to say it. She has three sons at the front, mother said rebukingly. I suppose that covers all her shortcomings in manners, I retorted. But I was ashamed, for it is true that all her boys have gone and she was very plucky and loyal about it too, and she's a perfect tower of strength in the Red Cross. It's a little hard to remember all the heroines. Just the same, it was her second new silk dress in one year, and that when everybody is, or should be, trying to save and serve. I had to bring out my green velvet hat again lately and begin wearing it. I hung on to my blue straw sailor as long as I could. How I hate the green velvet hat! It is so elaborate and conspicuous. I don't see how I could ever have liked it. But I vowed to wear it, and wear it I will. Shirley and I went down to the station this morning to take little Dog Monday a bang-up Christmas dinner. Dog Monday waits and watches there still, with just as much hope and confidence as ever. Sometimes he hangs around the station house and talks to people, and the rest of his time he sits at his little kennel door and watches the track unwinkingly. We never try to coax him home now. We know it is of no use. When Jem comes back, Monday will come home with him, and if Jem never comes back, Monday will wait there for him as long as his dear dog heart goes on beating. Fred Arnold was here last night. He was eighteen in November, and is going to enlist just as soon as his mother is over an operation she has to have. He has been coming here very often lately, and though I like him so much, it makes me uncomfortable, because I am afraid he is thinking that perhaps I could care something for him. I can't tell him about Ken, because, after all, what is there to tell? And yet I don't like to behave coldly and distantly when he will be going away so soon. It is very perplexing. I remember I used to think it would be such fun to have dozens of bows, and now I am worried to death because two are too many. I am learning to cook. Susan is teaching me. I tried to learn long ago, but, no, let me be honest. Susan tried to teach me, which is a very different thing. I never seemed to succeed with anything, and I got discouraged. But since the boys have gone away, I wanted to be able to make cake and things for them myself, and so I started in again, and this time I'm getting on surprisingly well. Susan says it is all in the way I hold my mouth, and Father says my subconscious mind is desirous of learning now, and I dare say they're both right. Anyhow, I can make dandy shortbread and fruit cake. I got ambitious last week and attempted cream puffs, but made an awful failure of them. They came out of the oven flat as flukes. I thought maybe the cream would fill them up again and make them plump, but it didn't. I think Susan was secretly pleased. She is past mistress in the art of making cream puffs, and it would break her heart if anyone else around here could make them as well. I wonder if Susan tampered— But no, I won't suspect her of such a thing. Miranda Pryor spent an afternoon here a few days ago, helping me cut out certain Red Cross garments known by the charming name of vermin shirts. Susan thinks that name is not quite decent, so I suggested she call them Cootie Sarks, which is old Highland Sandy's version of it. But she shook her head, and I heard her telling Mother later that, in her opinion, cooties and sarks were not proper subjects for young girls to talk about. She was especially horrified when Jem wrote in his last letter to Mother, "'Tell Susan I had a fine cootie hunt this morning and caught fifty-three. Susan positively turned pea-green. "'Mrs. Doctor, dear,' she said, "'when I was young, if decent people were so unfortunate as to get those insects, they kept it as secret if possible.' I do not want to be narrow-minded, Mrs. Dr. dear, but I still think it is better not to mention such things." Miranda grew confidential over our vermin shirts, and told me all her troubles. She is desperately unhappy. She is engaged to Joe Milgrave, and Joe joined up in October, and has been training in Charlottetown ever since. Her father was furious when he joined, and forbade Miranda ever to have any dealing or communication with him again. Poor Joe expects to go overseas any day, and wants Miranda to marry him before he goes which shows that there have been communications, in spite of Whiskers on the Moon. Miranda wants to marry him, but cannot, and she declares it will break her heart. "'Why don't you run away and marry him?' I said. It didn't go against my conscience in the least to give her such advice. Joe Milgrave is a splendid fellow, and Mr. Pryor fairly beamed on him until the war broke out, and I know Mr. Pryor would forgive Miranda very quickly, once it was over and he wanted his housekeeper back. But Miranda shook her silvery head dolefully. "'Joe wants me to, but I can't. Mother's last words to me as she lay on her dying bed were, Never, never run away, Miranda, and I promised. Miranda's mother died two years ago, and it seems, according to Miranda, that her mother and father actually ran away to be married themselves. To picture Whiskers on the Moon as the hero of an elopement is beyond my power. But such was the case, and Mrs. Pryor at least lived to repent it. She had a hard life of it with Mr. Pryor, and she thought it was a punishment on her for running away. So she made Miranda promise she would never, for any reason whatever, do it. 
Of course you cannot urge a girl to break a promise made to a dying mother. So I did not see what Miranda could do, unless she got Joe to come to the house when her father was away and marry her there. But Miranda said that couldn't be managed. Her father seemed to suspect she might be up to something of the sort, and he never went away for long at a time, and of course Joe couldn't get leave of absence at an hour's notice. No. I shall just have to let Joe go, and he will be killed. I know he will be killed, and my heart will break," said Miranda, her tears running down and copiously bedewing the vermin shirts. I'm not writing like this for lack of any real sympathy with poor Miranda. I've just got into the habit of giving things a comical twist, if I can, when I'm writing to Jem and Walter and Ken, to make them laugh. I really felt sorry for Miranda, who is as much in love with Joe as a china blue girl can be with anyone, and who is dreadfully ashamed of her father's pro-German sentiments. I think she understood that I did, for she said that she had wanted to tell me all about her worries, because I had grown so sympathetic this past year. I wonder if I have. I know I used to be a selfish, thoughtless creature. How selfish and thoughtless I'm ashamed to remember now, so I can't be quite so bad as I was. I wish I could help Miranda. It would be very romantic to contrive a war-wedding, and I should dearly love to get the better of whiskers on the moon. But at present the oracle has not spoken. End of chapter 17 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Karen Savage, Waco, Texas, July 2006. Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 18 A War Wedding. I can tell you this, Doctor dear, said Susan, pale with wrath, that Germany is getting to be perfectly ridiculous. They were all in the big Ingleside kitchen. Susan was mixing biscuits for supper, Mrs. Blythe was making shortbread for Jem, and Rilla was compounding candy for Ken and Walter. It had once been Walter and Ken in her thoughts, but somehow, quite unconsciously, this had changed until Ken's name came naturally first. Cousin Sophia was also there, knitting. All the boys were going to be killed in the long run, so Cousin Sophia felt in her bones, but they might better die with warm feet than cold ones, so Cousin Sophia knitted faithfully and gloomily. Into this peaceful scene erupted the doctor, wrathful and excited over the burning of the Parliament buildings in Ottawa, and Susan became automatically quite as wrathful and excited. "'What will those Huns do next?' she demanded. "'Coming over here and burning our Parliament building! Did anyone ever hear of such an outrage?' "'We don't know that the Germans are responsible for this,' said the doctor, much as if he felt quite sure they were. Fires do start without their agency sometimes. And Uncle Mark McAllister's barn was burnt last week. You can hardly accuse the Germans of that, Susan. Indeed, Dr. Dear, I do not know. Susan nodded slowly and portentously. Whiskers on the moon was there that very day. The fire broke out half an hour after he was gone. So much is a fact. But I shall not accuse a Presbyterian elder of burning anybody's barn until I have proof. However, everybody knows, Dr. Dear, that both Uncle Mark's boys have enlisted, and that Uncle Mark himself makes speeches at all the recruiting meetings. So no doubt Germany is anxious to get square with him." "'I could never speak at a recruiting meeting,' said Cousin Sophia solemnly. "'I could never reconcile it to my conscience to ask another woman's son to go, to murder and be murdered.' "'Could you not?' said Susan. "'Well, Sophia Crawford, I felt as if I could ask anyone to go when I read last night that there were no children under eight years of age left alive in Poland. Think of that, Sophia Crawford!' Susan shook a flowery finger at Sophia. "'Not one child under eight years of age!' "'I suppose the Germans has et em all,' sighed Cousin Sophia. "'Well, no,' said Susan, reluctantly, as if she hated to admit that there was any crime the Huns couldn't be accused of. The Germans have not turned cannibal yet, as far as I know. They have died of starvation and exposure, the poor little creatures. There is murdering for you, Cousin Sophia Crawford. The thought of it poisons every bite and sup I take. I see that Fred Carson of Lowbridge has been awarded a Distinguished Conduct Medal, remarked the doctor over his local paper. I heard that last week, said Susan. He is a battalion runner, and he did something extra brave and daring. His letter telling his folks about it came when his old grandmother Carson was on her dying bed. She had only a few minutes more to live, and the Episcopal minister, who was there, asked her if she would not like him to pray. "'Oh, yes, yes, you can pray,' she said impatient-like. She was a dean, Dr. dear, and the deans were always high-spirited. "'You can pray, but for pity's sake, pray low and don't disturb me. I want to think over this splendid news, and I have not much time left to do it.' That was Elmira Carson all over. Fred was the apple of her eye. She was seventy-five years of age, and had not a gray hair in her head, they tell me. "'By the way, that reminds me. I found a gray hair this morning—my very first, said Mrs. Blythe. 
I have noticed that grey hair for some time, Mrs. Dr. dear, but I did not speak of it. Thought I to myself, she has enough to bear. But now that you have discovered it, let me remind you that grey hairs are honourable. I must be getting old, Gilbert. Mrs. Blythe laughed a trifle ruefully. People are beginning to tell me I look so young. They never tell you that when you are young. But I shall not worry over my silver thread. I never liked red hair. Gilbert, did I ever tell you of that time, years ago at Green Gables, when I dyed my hair? Nobody but Marilla and I knew about it. Was that the reason you came out once with your hair shingled to the bone? <laughs> yes. I bought a bottle of dye from a German Jew peddler. I fondly expected it would turn my hair black, and it turned it green, so it had to be cut off. You had a narrow escape, Mrs. Dr. dear," exclaimed Susan. Of course you were too young then to know what a German was. It was a special mercy of Providence that it was only green dye and not poison. It seems hundreds of years since those Green Gables days," sighed Mrs. Blythe. They belong to another world altogether. Life has been cut in two by the chasm of war. What is ahead, I don't know. But it can't be a bit like the past. I wonder if those of us who have lived half our lives in the old world will ever feel wholly at home in the new. Have you noticed, asked Miss Oliver, glancing up from her book, how everything written before the war seems so far away now, too? One feels as if one was reading something as ancient as the Iliad. This poem of Wordsworth's, the senior class have it in their entrance work. I have been glancing over it. Its classic calm and repose and the beauty of the lines seem to belong to another planet, and to have as little to do with the present world welter as the evening star. The only thing I find much comfort in reading nowadays is the Bible," remarked Susan, whisking her biscuits into the oven. There are so many passages in it that seem to me exactly descriptive of the Huns. Old Highland Sandy declares that there is no doubt that the Kaiser is the Antichrist spoken of in Revelations. But I do not go as far as that. It would, in my humble opinion, Mrs. Dr. dear, be too great an honour for him." Early one morning, several days later, Miranda Pryor slipped up to Ingleside, ostensibly to get some Red Cross sewing, but in reality to talk over with sympathetic Rilla troubles that were past bearing alone. She brought her dog with her—an overfed, bandy-legged little animal, very dear to her heart, because Joe Milgrave had given it to her when it was a puppy. Mr. Pryor regarded all dogs with disfavour, but in those days he had looked kindly upon Joe as a suitor for Miranda's hand, and so he had allowed her to keep the puppy. Miranda was so grateful that she endeavoured to please her father by naming her dog after his political idol, the great liberal chieftain Sir Wilfrid Laurier, though his title was soon abbreviated to Wilfie. Sir Wilfrid grew and flourished and waxed fat, but Miranda spoiled him absurdly and nobody else liked him. Rilla especially hated him because of his detestable trick of lying flat on his back and entreating you with waving paws to tickle his sleek stomach. When she saw that Miranda's pale eyes bore unmistakable testimony of her having cried all night, Rilla asked her to come up to her room, knowing Miranda had a tale of woe to tell. But she ordered Sir Wilfrid to remain below. "'Oh, can't he come too?' said Miranda wistfully. "'Poor Wilfie won't be any bother, and I wiped his paws so carefully before I brought him in. He's always so lonesome in a strange place without me and very soon he'll be all I'll have left to remind me of Joe." Rilla yielded, and Sir Wilfrid, with his tail curled at a saucy angle over his brindled back, trotted triumphantly up the stairs before them. "'Oh, Rilla!' sobbed Miranda when they had reached sanctuary. "'I'm so unhappy. I can't begin to tell you how unhappy I am. Truly, my heart is breaking.' Rilla sat down on the lounge beside her. Sir Wilfrid squatted on his haunches before them, with his impertinent pink tongue stuck out, and listened. "'What is the trouble, Miranda?' "'Joe is coming home tonight on his last leave. I had a letter from him on Saturday. He sends my letters in care of Bob Crawford, you know, because of father. And, oh, Rilla, he will only have four days. He has to go away Friday morning, and I may never see him again.' "'Does he still want you to marry him?' asked Rilla. "'Oh, yes. He implored me in his letter to run away and be married. But I cannot do that, Rilla, not even for Joe. My only comfort is that I will be able to see him for a little while tomorrow afternoon. Father has to go to Charlottetown on business. At least we will have one good farewell talk. But, oh, afterwards! Why, Rilla, I know Father won't even let me go to the station Friday morning to see Joe off. Why in the world don't you and Joe get married tomorrow afternoon at home? demanded Rilla. Miranda swallowed a sob in such amazement that she almost choked. Why, why, that is impossible, Rilla! Why? briefly demanded the organizer of the Junior Red Cross and the transporter of babies in soup tureens. Why, why, we never thought of such a thing. Joe hasn't a license. I, ha I have no dress. I couldn't be married in black. I, I, we, you, you. 
Miranda lost herself altogether, and Sir Wilfrid, seeing that she was in dire distress, threw back his head and emitted a melancholy yelp. Rilla Blythe thought hard and rapidly for a few minutes. Then she said, "'Miranda, if you will put yourself into my hands, I'll have you married to Joe before four o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Oh, you couldn't. I can and I will, but you'll have to do exactly as I tell you. Oh, I don't think—oh, father will kill me. Nonsense. He'll be very angry, I suppose. But are you more afraid of your father's anger than you are of Joe's never coming back to you? No, said Miranda with sudden firmness. I'm not. Will you do as I tell you, then? Yes, I will. Then get Joe on the long distance at once, and tell him to bring out a license and ring tonight. Oh, I couldn't! wailed the aghast Miranda. It, it would be so, so indelicate. Rilla shut her little white teeth together with a snap. Heaven grant me patience, she said under her breath. I'll do it then, she said aloud. And meanwhile, you go home and make what preparations you can. When I phone down to you to come up and help me, so come at once. As soon as Miranda, pallid, scared, but desperately resolved, had gone, Rilla flew to the telephone and put in a long distance call for Charlottetown. She got through with such surprising quickness that she was convinced Providence approved of her undertaking, but it was a good hour before she could get in touch with Joe Milgrave at his camp. Meanwhile, she paced impatiently about, and prayed that when she did get Joe, there would be no listeners on the line to carry news to Whiskers on the Moon. Is that you, Joe? Rilla Blythe is speaking. Rilla! Rilla! Oh, never mind. Listen to this. Before you come home tonight, get a marriage license. A marriage license? Yes, a marriage license. And a wedding ring. Did you get that? And will you do it? Very well. Be sure you do it. It is your only chance. Flushed with triumph, for her only fear was that she might not be able to locate Joe in time, Rilla rang the prior ring. This time she had not such good luck, for she drew whiskers on the moon. Is that Miranda? Oh, m Mr. Pryor. Well, Mr. Pryor, will you kindly ask Miranda if she can come up this afternoon and help me with some sewing? It is very important, or I would not trouble her. Oh, thank you. Mr. Pryor had consented somewhat grumpily, but he had consented. He did not want to offend Dr. Blythe, and he knew that if he refused to allow Miranda to do any Red Cross work, public opinion would make the Glen too hot for comfort. Rilla went out to the kitchen, shut all the doors with a mysterious expression which alarmed Susan, and then said solemnly, "'Susan, can you make a wedding cake this afternoon?' "'A wedding cake?' Susan stared. Rilla had, without any warning, brought her a war baby once upon a time. Was she now, with equal suddenness, going to produce a husband? Yes, a wedding cake, a scrumptious wedding cake, Susan, a beautiful, plummy, eggy, citron peely wedding cake. And we must make other things, too. I'll help you in the morning, but I can't help you in the afternoon, for I have to make a wedding dress, and time is the essence of the contract, Susan. Susan felt that she was really too old to be subjected to such shocks. Who are you going to marry, Rilla? she asked feebly. Susan, darling, I am not the happy bride. Miranda Pryor is going to marry Joe Milgrave tomorrow afternoon while her father is away in town. A war wedding, Susan. Isn't that thrilling and romantic? I never was so excited in my life. The excitement soon spread over Ingleside, infecting even Mrs. Blythe and Susan. I'll go to work on that cake at once, vowed Susan, with a glance at the clock. Mrs. Doctor, dear, will you pick over the fruit and beat up the eggs? If you will, I can have that cake ready for the oven by the evening. Tomorrow morning we can make salads and other things. I will work all night, if necessary, to get the better of whiskers on the moon." Miranda arrived, tearful and breathless. "'We must fix over my white dress for you to wear,' said Rilla. "'It will fit you very nicely with a little alteration.'" To work went the two girls, ripping, fitting, basting, sewing for dear life. By dint of unceasing effort they got the dress done by seven o'clock, and Miranda tried it on in Rilla's room. "'It's very pretty, but, oh, if I could just have a veil,' sighed Miranda. I've always dreamed of being married in a lovely white veil. Some good fairy evidently waits on the wishes of war brides. The door opened, and Mrs. Blythe came in, her arms full of a filmy burden. "'Miranda, dear,' she said, "'I want you to wear my wedding veil tomorrow. It is twenty-four years since I was a bride at Old Green Gables, the happiest bride that ever was. And the wedding veil of a happy bride brings good luck, they say. "'Oh, how sweet of you, Mrs. Blythe,' said Miranda, the ready tears starting to her eyes. The veil was tried on and draped. Susan dropped in to approve, but dared not linger. "'I've got that cake in the oven,' she said, "'and I am pursuing a policy of watchful waiting. The evening news is that the Grand Duke has captured Erzurum. That is a pill for the Turks. I wish I had a chance to tell the Tsar just what a mistake he made when he turned Nicholas down.' Susan disappeared downstairs to the kitchen, whence a terrible thud and piercing shriek presently sounded. 
Everybody rushed to the kitchen, the doctor and Miss Oliver, Mrs. Blythe, Rilla, Miranda in her wedding veil. Susan was sitting flatly in the middle of the kitchen floor with a dazed, bewildered look on her face, while Doc, evidently in his hide incarnation, was standing on the dresser with his back up, his eyes blazing, and his tail the size of three tails. "'Susan, what has happened?' cried Mrs. Blythe in alarm. "'Did you fall? Are you hurt?' Susan picked herself up. "'No,' she said grimly. "'I am not hurt, though I am jarred all over. Do not be alarmed. As for what happened, I tried to kick that darn cat with both feet. That's what happened.' Everybody shrieked with laughter. The doctor was quite helpless. "'Oh, Susan, Susan!' he gasped. "'That I should live to hear you swear!' "'I am sorry,' said Susan, in real distress, "'that I used such an expression before two young girls. But I said that beast was darned, and darned it is. It belonged to old Nick.' "'Do you expect it will vanish some of these days with a bang in the odour of brimstone, Susan?' "'It will go to its own place in due time, and that you may tie to.' said Susan, dourly, shaking out her rattled bones and going to her oven. I suppose my plunking down like that has shaken my cake so that it will be as heavy as lead. But the cake was not heavy. It was all a bride's cake should be, and Susan iced it beautifully. Next day she and Rilla worked all the forenoon, making delicacies for the wedding feast, and as soon as Miranda phoned up that her father was safely off, everything was packed in a big hamper and taken down to the prior house. Joe soon arrived in his uniform, in a state of violent excitement— accompanied by his best man, Sergeant Malcolm Crawford. There were quite a few guests, for all the Manse and Ingleside folk were there, and a dozen or so of Joe's relatives, including his mother, Mrs. Dead Angus Milgrave, so called, cheerfully, to distinguish her from another lady whose Angus was living. Mrs. Dead Angus wore a rather disapproving expression, not caring over much for this alliance with the house of Whiskers on the Moon. So Miranda Pryor was married to Private Joseph Milgrave, on his last leave. It should have been a romantic wedding, but it was not. There were too many factors working against romance, as even Rilla had to admit. In the first place, Miranda, in spite of her dress and veil, was such a flat-faced, commonplace, uninteresting little bride. In the second place, Joe cried bitterly all through the ceremony, and this vexed Miranda unreasonably. Long afterwards, she told Rilla, "'I just felt like saying to him then and there, "'If you feel so bad over having to marry me, you don't have to.' But it was just because he was thinking all the time of how soon he would have to leave me." In the third place, Jims, who was usually so well behaved in public, took a fit of shyness and contrariness combined, and began to cry at the top of his voice for Willa. Nobody wanted to take him out, because everybody wanted to see the marriage, so Rilla, who was a bridesmaid, had to take him and hold him during the ceremony. In the fourth place, Sir Wilfrid Laurier took a fit. Sir Wilfrid was entrenched in a corner of the room behind Miranda's piano. During his seizure he made the weirdest, most unearthly noises. He would begin with a series of choking, spasmodic sounds, continuing into a gruesome gurgle, and ending up with a strangled howl. Nobody could hear a word Mr. Meredith was saying, except now and then, when Sir Wilfrid stopped for breath. Nobody looked at the bride except Susan, who never dragged her fascinated eyes from Miranda's face. All the others were gazing at the dog. Miranda had been trembling with nervousness, but as soon as Sir Wilfrid began his performance she forgot it. All that she could think of was that her dear dog was dying, and she could not go to him. She never remembered a word of the ceremony. Rilla, who, in spite of Jim's, had been trying her best to look rapt and romantic as beseemed a war bridesmaid, gave up the hopeless attempt and devoted her energies to choking down untimely merriment. She dared not look at anybody in the room, especially Mrs. Dead Angus, for fear all her suppressed mirth should suddenly explode in a most unyoung ladylike yell of laughter. But married they were. And then they had a wedding supper in the dining-room, which was so lavish and bountiful that you would have thought it was the product of a month's labour. Everybody had brought something. Mrs. Dead Angus had brought a large apple pie, which she placed on a chair in the dining-room, and then absently sat down on it. Neither her temper nor her black silk wedding garment was improved thereby, but the pie was never missed at the gay bridal feast. Mrs. Dead Angus eventually took it home with her again. Whiskers on the Moon's pacifist pig should not get it anyhow. That evening Mr. and Mrs. Joe, accompanied by the recovered Sir Wilfrid, departed for the Four Winds Lighthouse, which was kept by Joe's uncle, and in which they meant to spend their brief honeymoon. Una Meredith and Rilla and Susan washed the dishes, tidied up, left a cold supper and Miranda's pitiful little note on the table for Mr. Pryor, and walked home while the mystic veil of dreamy, haunted winter twilight wrapped itself over the glen. "'I would really not have minded being a war bride myself,' remarked Susan sentimentally. But Rilla felt rather flat perhaps as a reaction to all the excitement and the rush of the past thirty-six hours. She was disappointed somehow. The whole affair had been so ludicrous, and Miranda and Joe so lachrymose and commonplace. 
"'If Miranda hadn't given that wretched dog such an enormous dinner, he wouldn't have had that fit,' she said crossly. "'I warned her, but she said she couldn't starve the poor dog. He would soon be all she had left, etc. I could have shaken her.' "'The best man was more excited than Joe was,' said Susan. He wished Miranda many happy returns of the day. She did not look very happy, but perhaps you could not expect that under the circumstances. Anyhow, thought Rilla, I can write a perfectly killing account of it to all the boys. How Jem will howl over Sir Wilfrid's part in it! But if Rilla was rather disappointed in the war wedding, she found nothing lacking on Friday morning when Miranda said good-bye to her bridegroom at the Glen Station. The dawn was white as a pearl, clear as a diamond. Behind the station the balsamy copse of young firs was frost-misted. The cold moon of dawn hung over the westering snowfields, but the golden fleeces of sunrise shone above the maples up at Ingleside. Joe took his pale little bride in his arms, and she lifted her face to his. Rilla choked suddenly. It did not matter that Miranda was insignificant and commonplace and flat-featured. It did not matter that she was the daughter of Whiskers on the Moon. All that matters was that rapt, sacrificial look in her eyes, that ever-burning, sacred fire of devotion and loyalty and fine courage that she was mutely promising Joe she and thousands of other women would keep alive at home while their men held the western front. Rilla walked away, realizing that she must not spy on such a moment. She went down to the end of the platform where Sir Wilfrid and Dog Monday were sitting, looking at each other. Sir Wilfrid remarked condescendingly, "'Why do you haunt this old shed when you might lie on the hearthrug at Ingleside and live on the fat of the land? Is it a pose, or a fixed idea?' Whereat Dog Monday, laconically, "'I have a tryst to keep.' When the train had gone, Rilla rejoined the little trembling Miranda. "'Well, he's gone,' said Miranda, "'and he may never come back. But I'm his wife, and I'm going to be worthy of him. I'm going home." "'Don't you think you had better come with me now?' asked Rilla doubtfully. Nobody knew yet how Mr. Pryor had taken the matter. No. If Joe can face the Huns, I guess I can face Father," said Miranda daringly. A soldier's wife can't be a coward. Come on, Wilfie, I'll go straight home and meet the worst. There was nothing very dreadful to face, however. Perhaps Mr. Pryor had reflected that housekeepers were hard to get, and that there were many Milgrave homes open to Miranda. Also, that there was such a thing as a separation allowance. At all events, though he told her grumpily that she had made a nice fool of herself and would live to regret it, he said nothing worse, and Mrs. Joe put on her apron and went to work as usual, while Sir Wilfrid Laurier, who had a poor opinion of lighthouses for winter residences, went to sleep in his pet nook behind the wood-box, a thankful dog that he was done with war weddings. End of chapter 18 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Karen Savage, Waco, Texas, July 2006. Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 19. They Shall Not Pass. One cold gray morning in February, Gertrude Oliver, wakened with a shiver, slipped into Rilla's room and crept in beside her. Rilla, I'm frightened. Frightened as a baby. I've had another of my strange dreams. Something terrible is before us, I know. What is it? asked Rilla. I was standing again on the veranda steps, just as I stood in that dream on the night before the lighthouse dance, and in the sky a huge, black, menacing thunder-cloud rolled up from the east. I could see its shadow racing before it, and when it enveloped me I shivered with icy cold. Then the storm broke, and it was a dreadful storm, blinding flash after flash and a deafening peal after peal, driving torrents of rain. I turned in panic and tried to run for shelter. And as I did so, a man, a soldier in the uniform of a French army officer, dashed up the steps and stood beside me on the threshold of the door. His clothes were soaked with blood from a wound in his breast. He seemed spent and exhausted. But his white face was set, and his eyes blazed in his hollow face. "'They shall not pass,' he said in low, passionate tones, which I heard distinctly amid all the turmoil of the storm. Then I awakened. "'Rilla, I'm frightened.' The spring will not bring the big push we've all been hoping for. Instead, it is going to bring some dreadful blow to France, I am sure of it. The Germans will try to smash through somewhere." "'But he told you they would not pass,' said Rilla seriously. She never laughed at Gertrude's dreams as the doctor did. "'I do not know if that was prophecy or desperation, Rilla. The horror of that dream holds me yet in an icy grip. We shall need all our courage before long.'" Dr. Blythe did laugh at the breakfast-table. But he never laughed at Miss Oliver's dreams again, for that day brought news of the opening of the Verdun offensive. 
and thereafter, through all the beautiful weeks of spring, the Ingleside family, one and all, lived in a trance of dread. There were days when they waited in despair for the end as foot by foot the Germans crept nearer and nearer to the grim barrier of desperate France. Susan's deeds were in her spotless kitchen at Ingleside, but her thoughts were on the hills around Verdun. Mrs. Doctor, dear, she would stick her head in at Mrs. Blythe's door the last thing at night to remark, I do hope the French have hung on to the crowswood today. And she woke at dawn to wonder if Dead Man's Hill, surely named by some prophet, was still held by the Poilus. Susan could have drawn a map of the country around Verdun that would have satisfied a chief of staff. If the Germans capture Verdun, the spirit of France will be broken, Miss Oliver said bitterly. But they will not capture it, staunchly said Susan, who could not eat her dinner that day for fear lest they do that very thing. In the first place, you dreamed they would not. You dreamed the very thing the French are saying before they ever said it. They shall not pass. I declare to you, Miss Oliver, dear, when I read that in the paper and remembered your dream, I went cold all over with awe. It seemed to me like biblical times when people dream things like that quite frequently. I know, I know, said Gertrude, walking restlessly about. I cling to a persistent faith in my dream, too, but every time bad news comes it fails me. Then I tell myself mere coincidence, subconscious memory, and so forth. I do not see how any memory could remember a thing before it was ever said at all, persisted Susan, though of course I am not educated like you and the doctor. I would rather not be, if it makes anything as simple as that so hard to believe. But in any case we need not worry over Verdun, even if the Huns get it. Joffre says it has no military significance. That old sop of comfort has been served up too often already when reverses came, retorted Gertrude. It has lost its power to charm. Was there ever a battle like this in the world before? said Mr. Meredith one evening in mid-April. It's such a titanic thing we can't grasp it, said the doctor. What were the scraps of a few Homeric handfuls compared to this? The whole Trojan War might be fought around a Verdun fort, and a newspaper correspondent would give it no more than a sentence. I am not in the confidence of the occult powers. The doctor threw at Gertrude a twinkle. But I have a hunch that the fate of the whole war hangs on the issue of Verdun. As Susan and Joffre say, it has no real military significance, but it has the tremendous significance of an idea. If Germany wins there, she will win the war. If she loses, the tide will set against her. Lose she will, said Mr. Meredith emphatically. The idea cannot be conquered. France is certainly very wonderful. It seems to me that in her I see the white form of civilization making a determined stand against the black powers of barbarism. I think our whole world realizes this, and that is why we all await the issue so breathlessly. It isn't merely the question of a few forts changing hands or a few miles of blood soaked ground lost and won. I wonder, said Gertrude dreamily, if some great blessing, great enough for the price, will be the meat of all our pain. Is the agony in which the world is shuddering the birth pang of some wondrous new era? Or is it merely a futile struggle of ants in the gleam of a million million of suns? We think very lightly, Mr. Meredith, of a calamity which destroys an anthill and half its inhabitants. Does the power that runs the universe think us of more importance than we think ants? You forget said Mr. Meredith, with a flash of his dark eyes, that an infinite power must be infinitely little as well as infinitely great. We are neither. Therefore there are things too little as well as too great for us to apprehend. To the infinitely little, an ant is of as much importance as a mastodon. We are witnessing the birth pangs of a new era, but it will be born a feeble, wailing life like everything else. I am not one of those who expect a new heaven and a new earth as the immediate result of this war. That is not the way God works. But work he does, Miss Oliver, and in the end his purpose will be fulfilled. Sound and orthodox, sound and orthodox, muttered Susan approvingly in the kitchen. Susan liked to see Miss Oliver sat upon by the minister now and then. Susan was very fond of her, but she thought Miss Oliver liked saying heretical things to ministers far too well, and deserved an occasional reminder that these matters were quite beyond her province. In May Walter wrote home that he had been awarded a D.C. medal. He did not say what for, but the other boys took care that the Glen should know the brave thing Walter had done. In any war but this, wrote Jerry Meredith, it would have meant a V.C., but they can't make V.C.s as common as the brave things done every day here. He should have had the V.C., said Susan, and was very indignant over it. 
She was not quite sure who was to blame for his not getting it, but if it were General Haig, she began for the first time to entertain serious doubts as to his fitness for being commander-in-chief. Rilla was beside herself with delight. It was her dear Walter who had done this thing, Walter to whom someone had sent a white feather at Redmond. It was Walter who had dashed back from the safety of the trench to drag in a wounded comrade who had fallen on no man's land. Oh, she could see his white, beautiful face and wonderful eyes as he did it. What a thing to be the sister of such a hero! And he hadn't thought it worth while writing about. His letter was full of other things, little intimate things that they two had known and loved together in the dear old cloudless days of a century ago. "'I've been thinking of the daffodils in the garden at Ingleside,' he wrote. "'By the time you get this they will be out, blowing there under that lovely rosy sky. Are they really as bright and golden as ever, Rilla? It seems to me that they must be dyed red with blood, like our poppies here. And every whisper of spring will be falling as a violet in Rainbow Valley.' There is a young moon tonight, a slender, silver, lovely thing hanging over these pits of torment. Will you see it tonight over the maple grove? I'm enclosing a little scrap of verse, Rilla. I wrote it one evening in my trench dugout by the light of a bit of candle. Or rather, it came to me there. I didn't feel as if I were writing it. Something seemed to use me as an instrument. I've had that feeling once or twice before, but very rarely, and never so strongly as this time. That was why I sent it over to the London Spectator. It printed it, and the copy came today. I hope you'll like it. It's the only poem I've written since I came overseas." The poem was a short, poignant little thing. In a month it had carried Walter's name to every corner of the globe. Everywhere it was copied, in metropolitan dailies and little village weeklies, in profound reviews and agony columns, in Red Cross appeals and government recruiting propaganda. Mothers and sisters wept over it, young lads thrilled to it. The whole great heart of humanity caught it up as an epitome of all the pain and hope and pity and purpose of the mighty conflict, crystallized in three brief immortal verses. A Canadian lad in the Flanders trenches had written the one great poem of the war. The Piper, by Private Walter Blythe, was a classic from its first printing. Rilla copied it in her diary at the beginning of an entry in which she poured out the story of the hard week that had just passed. It has been such a dreadful week, she wrote, and even though it is over, and we know that it was all a mistake, that does not seem to do away with the bruises left by it. And yet it has in some ways been a very wonderful week, and I have had some glimpses of things I never realized before, of how fine and brave people can be even in the midst of horrible suffering. I am sure I could never be as splendid as Miss Oliver was. Just a week ago she had a letter from Mr. Grant's mother in Charlottetown and it told her that a cable had just come saying that Major Robert Grant had been killed in action a few days before. Oh, poor Gertrude! At first she was crushed. Then after just a day she pulled herself together and went back to her school. She did not cry. I never saw her shed a tear. But, oh, her face and eyes! I must go on with my work, she said. That is my duty just now. I could never have risen to such a height. She never spoke bitterly except once, when Susan said something about spring being here at last, and Gertrude said, "'Can the spring really come this year?' Then she laughed. Such a dreadful little laugh, just as one might laugh in the face of death, I think, and said, "'Observe my egotism. Because I, Gertrude Oliver, have lost a friend, it is incredible that the spring can come as usual. The spring does not fail because of the million agonies of others, but for mine—' Oh, can the universe go on? Don't feel bitter with yourself, dear, mother said gently. It is a very natural thing to feel as if things couldn't go on just the same when some great blow has changed the world for us. We all feel like that. Then that horrid old cousin Sophia of Susan's piped up. She was sitting there knitting and croaking like an old raven of bode and woe, as Walter used to call her. "'You ain't as bad off as some, Miss Oliver,' she said, "'and you shouldn't take it so hard. "'There's some as has lost their husbands. "'That's a hard blow. "'And there's some as has lost their sons. "'You haven't lost either husband or son.' "'No,' said Gertrude, more bitterly still. "'It's true I haven't lost a husband. "'I have only lost the man who would have been my husband. "'I have lost no son, "'only the sons and daughters who might have been born to me, "'who will never be born to me now.' "'It isn't ladylike to talk like that,' said Cousin Sophia in a shocked tone. And then Gertrude laughed right out, so wildly that Cousin Sophia was really frightened. And when poor tortured Gertrude, unable to endure it any longer, hurried out of the room, Cousin Sophia asked Mother if the blow hadn't affected Miss Oliver's mind. 
"'I suffered the loss of two good, kind partners,' she said, "'but it did not affect me like that. "'I should think it wouldn't. "'Those poor men must have been thankful to die.' I heard Gertrude walking up and down her room most of the night. She walked like that every night, but never so long as that night. And once I heard her give a dreadful, sudden little cry as if she had been stabbed. I couldn't sleep for suffering with her, and I couldn't help her. I thought the night would never end. But it did. And then joy came in the morning, as the Bible says. Only it didn't come exactly in the morning, but well along in the afternoon. The telephone rang, and I answered it. It was old Mrs. Grant, speaking from Charlottetown, and her news was that it was all a mistake. Robert wasn't killed at all. He had only been slightly wounded in the arm and was safe in the hospital, out of harm's way for a time, anyhow. They hadn't learned yet how the mistake had happened, but supposed there must have been another Robert Grant. I hung up the telephone and flew to Rainbow Valley. I'm sure I did fly. I can't remember my feet ever touching the ground. I met Gertrude on her way home from school, in the glade of spruces where we used to play, and I just gasped out the news to her. I ought to have had more sense, of course, but I was so crazy with joy and excitement that I never stopped to think. Gertrude just dropped there among the golden young ferns as if she had been shot. The fright it gave me ought to make me sensible, in this respect at least, for the rest of my life. I thought I had killed her. I remembered that her mother had died very suddenly from heart failure when quite a young woman. It seemed years to me before I discovered that her heart was still beating. A pretty time I had. I never saw anybody faint before, and I knew there was nobody up at the house to help, because everybody else had gone to the station to meet Di and Nan coming home from Redmond. But I knew, theoretically, how people in a faint should be treated, and now I know it practically. Luckily the brook was handy, and after I had worked frantically over her for a while, Gertrude came back to life. She never said one word about my news, and I didn't dare to refer to it again. I helped her walk up through the maple grove and up to her room. And then she said, "'Rob is living,' as if the words were torn out of her, and flung herself on her bed and cried and cried and cried. I never saw anyone cry so before. All the tears that she hadn't shed all that week came then. She cried most of last night, I think. But her face this morning looked as if she had seen a vision of some kind, and we were all so happy that we were almost afraid. Di and Nan are home for a couple of weeks. Then they go back to Red Cross work in the training camp at Kingsport. I envy them. Father says I'm doing just as good work here with Jims and my junior Reds, but it lacks the romance theirs must have. Coot has fallen. It was almost a relief when it did fall. We had been dreading it so long. It crushed us flat for a day, and then we picked up and put it behind us. Cousin Sophia was as gloomy as usual, and came over and groaned that the British were losing everywhere. "'They're good losers,' said Susan grimly. When they lose a thing, they keep on looking till they find it again. Anyhow, my king and country need me now to cut potato sets for the back garden, so get you a knife and help me, Sophia Crawford. It will divert your thoughts and keep you from worrying over a campaign that you are not called upon to run. Susan is an old brick, and the way she flattens out poor cousin Sophia is beautiful to behold. As for Verdun, that battle goes on and on, and we see-saw between hope and fear— but I know that strange dream of Miss Oliver's foretold the victory of France. They shall not pass. End of chapter 19 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Karen Savage, Waco, Texas, July 2006 Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery Chapter 20 Norman Douglas Speaks Out in Meeting "'Where are you wandering, Anne of mine?' asked the doctor, who even yet, after twenty-four years of marriage, occasionally addressed his wife thus when nobody was about. Anne was sitting on the veranda steps, gazing absently over the wonderful bridal world of spring blossom. Beyond the white orchard was a copse of dark young firs, and creamy wild cherries, where the robins were whistling madly, for it was evening and the fire of early stars was burning over the maple grove. Anne came back with a little sigh. I was just taking relief from intolerable realities in a dream, Gilbert, a dream that all our children were home again, and all small again, playing in Rainbow Valley. It is always so silent now, but I was imagining I heard clear voices and gay childish sounds coming up as I was used to. I could hear Jem's whistle and Walter's yodel, and the twins' laughter, and for just a few blessed minutes I forgot about the guns on the western front, and had a little false sweet happiness. The doctor did not answer. 
Sometimes his work tricked him into forgetting for a few moments the western front, but not often. There was a good deal of grey now in his still thick curls that had not been there two years ago. Yet he smiled down into the starry eyes he loved, the eyes that had once been so full of laughter, and now seemed always full of unshed tears. Susan wandered by with a hoe in her hand and her second best bonnet on her head. I have just finished reading a piece in the Enterprise which told of a couple being married in an aeroplane. Do you think it would be legal, Doctor dear? she inquired anxiously. I think so, said the doctor gravely. Well, said Susan dubiously, it seems to me that a wedding is too solemn for anything so giddy as an aeroplane. But nothing is the same as it used to be. Well, it is half an hour yet before prayer meeting time, so I am going around to the kitchen garden to have a little evening hate with the weeds. But all the time I am strafing them, I will be thinking about this new worry in the Trentino. I do not like this Austrian caper, Mrs. Dr. dear. Nor I, said Mrs. Blythe ruefully. All the forenoon I preserved rhubarb with my hands and waited for the war news with my soul. When it came, I shriveled. Well, I suppose I must go and get ready for the prayer meeting, too. Every village has its own little unwritten history, handed down from lip to lip through the generations, of tragic, comic, and dramatic events. They are told at weddings and festivals, and rehearsed around winter firesides. And in these oral annals of Glen St. Mary, the tale of the Union prayer meeting held that night in the Methodist Church was destined to fill an imperishable place. The Union prayer meeting was Mr. Arnold's idea. The county battalion, which had been training all winter in Charlottetown, was to leave shortly for overseas. The Four Winds Harbour boys belonging to it from the Glen and Over Harbour and Harbour Head and Upper Glen were all home on their last leave, and Mr. Arnold thought, properly enough, that it would be a fitting thing to hold a Union prayer meeting for them before they went away. Mr. Meredith having agreed, the meeting was announced to be held in the Methodist Church. Glen prayer meetings were not apt to be too well attended, but on this particular evening the Methodist Church was crowded. Everybody who could go was there. Even Miss Cornelia came, and it was the first time in her life that Miss Cornelia had ever set foot inside a Methodist church. It took no less than a world conflict to bring that about. "'I used to hate Methodists,' said Miss Cornelia calmly, when her husband expressed surprise over her going. "'But I don't hate them now. There is no sense in hating Methodists when there is a Kaiser or a Hindenburg in the world.' So Miss Cornelia went. Norman Douglas and his wife went, too and Whiskers on the Moon strutted up the aisle to a front pew, as if he fully realized what a distinction he conferred upon the building. People were somewhat surprised that he should be there, since he usually avoided all assemblages connected in any way with the war. But Mr. Meredith had said that he hoped his session would be well represented, and Mr. Pryor had evidently taken the request to heart. He wore his best black suit and white tie, his thick, tight, iron-gray curls were neatly arranged, and his broad, red round face looked, as Susan most uncharitably thought, more sanctimonious than ever. The minute I saw that man coming into the church looking like that, I felt that mischief was brewing, Mrs. Dr. dear, she said afterwards. What form it would take, I could not tell, but I knew from face of him that he had come there for no good. The prayer meeting opened conventionally and continued quietly. Mr. Meredith spoke first with his usual eloquence and feeling. Mr. Arnold followed with an address which even Miss Cornelia had to confess was irreproachable in taste and subject matter. And then Mr. Arnold asked Mr. Pryor to lead in prayer. Miss Cornelia had always averred that Mr. Arnold had no gumption. Miss Cornelia was not apt to err on the side of charity in her judgment of Methodist ministers, but in this case she did not greatly overshoot the mark. The Reverend Mr. Arnold certainly did not have much of that desirable, indefinable quality known as gumption, or he would never have asked Whiskers on the Moon to lead in prayer at a khaki prayer meeting. He thought he was returning the compliment to Mr. Meredith, who, at the conclusion of his address, had asked a Methodist deacon to lead. Some people expected Mr. Pryor to refuse grumpily, and that would have made enough scandal. But Mr. Pryor bounded briskly to his feet, unctuously said, "'Let us pray,' and forthwith prayed." In a sonorous voice which penetrated to every corner of the crowded building, Mr. Pryor poured forth a flood of fluent words, and was well on in his prayer before his dazed and horrified audience awakened to the fact that they were listening to a pacifist appeal of the rankest sort. Mr. Pryor had at least the courage of his convictions, or perhaps, as people afterwards said, he thought he was safe in a church, and that it was an excellent chance to air certain opinions he dared not voice elsewhere for fear of being mobbed. He prayed that the unholy war might cease, 
that the deluded armies being driven to slaughter on the western front might have their eyes open to their iniquity, and repent while yet there was time, that the poor young men present in khaki, who had been hounded into a path of murder and militarism, should yet be rescued, Mr. Pryor had got this far without let or hindrance, and so paralyzed were his hearers, and so deeply imbued with their born and bred conviction that no disturbance must ever be made in a church, no matter what the provocation, that it seemed likely that he would continue unchecked to the end. But one man at least in that audience was not hampered by inherited or acquired reverence for the sacred edifice. Norman Douglas was, as Susan had often vowed crisply, nothing more or less than a pagan. But he was a rampantly patriotic pagan, and when the significance of what Mr. Pryor was saying fully dawned on him, Norman Douglas suddenly went berserk. With a positive roar he bounded to his feet in his side-pew, facing the audience, and shouted in tones of thunder, "'Stop! Stop! Stop that abominable prayer! What an abominable prayer!' Every head in the church flew up. A boy in khaki at the back gave a faint cheer. Mr. Meredith raised a deprecating hand, but Norman was past caring for anything like that. Eluding his wife's restraining grasp, he gave one mad spring over the front of the pew and caught the unfortunate whiskers on the moon by his coat-collar. Mr. Pryor had not stopped when so bidden, but he stopped now, perforce, for Norman, his long red beard literally bristling with fury, was shaking him until his bones fairly rattled, and punctuating his shakes with a lurid assortment of abusive epithets. "'You blatant beast! Shake! You malignant carrion! Shake! You pig-headed varmint! Shake! You putrid pup! Shake! You pestilential parasite! Shake! You hunnish scum! Shake! "'You indecent reptile! You—you—' you. Norman choked for a moment. Everybody believed that the next thing he would say, church or no church, would be something that would have to be spelt with asterisks. But at that moment Norman encountered his wife's eye, and he fell back with a thud on holy writ. "'You whited sepulchre!' he bellowed with a final shake, and cast whiskers on the moon from him with a vigour which impelled that unhappy pacifist to the very verge of the choir entrance door. Mr. Pryor's once ruddy face was ashen, but he turned at bay. "'I'll have the law on you for this!' he gasped. "'Do! Do!' roared Norman, making another rush. But Mr. Pryor was gone. He had no desire to fall a second time into the hands of an avenging militarist. Norman turned to the platform for one graceless, triumphant moment. "'Don't look so flabbergasted, Parsons,' he boomed. "'You couldn't do it. Nobody would expect it of the cloth. But somebody had to do it. You know you're glad I threw him out. He couldn't be let go on yammering and yodeling and yawping sedition and treason. Sedition and treason. Somebody had to deal with it.' I was born for this hour. I've had my innings in church at last. I can sit quiet for another sixty years now. Go ahead with your meeting, Parsons. I reckon you won't be troubled with any more pacifist prayers." But the spirit of devotion and reverence had fled. Both ministers realized it, and realized that the only thing to do was to close the meeting quietly and let the excited people go. Mr. Meredith addressed a few earnest words to the boys in khaki which probably saved Mr. Pryor's windows from a second onslaught. And Mr. Arnold pronounced an incongruous benediction. At least, he felt it was incongruous, for he could not at once banish from his memory the sight of gigantic Norman Douglas shaking the fat, pompous little whiskers on the moon as a huge mastiff might shake an overgrown puppy. And he knew that the same picture was in everybody's mind. Altogether, the Union prayer-meeting could hardly be called an unqualified success but it was remembered in Glen St. Mary when scores of orthodox and undisturbed assemblies were totally forgotten. "'You will never, no never, Mrs. Dr. dear, hear me call Norman Douglas a pagan again,' said Susan, when she reached home. "'If Ellen Douglas is not a proud woman this night, she should be.' "'Norman Douglas did a wholly indefensible thing,' said the doctor. Pryor should have been let severely alone until the meeting was over. Then, later on, his own minister in session should deal with him.' That would have been the proper procedure. Norman's performance was utterly improper and scandalous and outrageous. But by George! The doctor threw back his head and chuckled. By George, Anne girl, it was satisfying. End of chapter 20. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Karen Savage, Waco, Texas, July 2006. Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 21 Love Affairs Are Horrible. Ingleside, 20th June, 1916. We have been so busy, and day after day has brought such exciting news, good and bad, that I haven't had time and composure to write in my diary for weeks. I like to keep it up regularly, for Father says a diary of the years of the war should be a very interesting thing to hand down to one's children. The trouble is, I like to write a few personal things in this blessed old book that might not be exactly what I'd want my children to read. I feel that I shall be a far greater stickler for propriety in regard to them than I am for myself. The first week in June was another dreadful one. The Austrians seemed just on the point of overrunning Italy. And then came the first awful news of the Battle of Jutland, which the Germans claimed as a great victory. Susan was the only one who carried on. "'You need never tell me that the Kaiser has defeated the British Navy,' she said with a contemptuous sniff. "'It is all a German lie, and that you may tie to.' And when a couple of days later we found out that she was right, and that it had been a British victory instead of a British defeat, we had to put up with a great many I told you so's but we endured them very comfortably. It took Kitchener's death to finish Susan. For the first time I saw her down and out. We all felt the shock of it, but Susan plumbed the depths of despair. The news came at night by phone, but Susan wouldn't believe it until she saw the Enterprise headline the next day. She did not cry or faint or go into hysterics, but she forgot to put salt in the soup, and that is something Susan never did in my recollection. Mother and Miss Oliver and I cried. But Susan looked at us in stony sarcasm and said, "'The Kaiser and his six sons are all alive and thriving. So the world is not left wholly desolate. Why cry, Mrs. Dr. dear?' Susan continued in this stony, hopeless condition for twenty-four hours, and then Cousin Sophia appeared and began to condole with her. "'This is terrible news, ain't it, Susan? We might as well prepare for the worst, for it is bound to come. You said once, and well do I remember the words, Susan Baker.' that you had complete confidence in God and Kitchener. Ah, well, Susan Baker, there is only God left now." Whereat Cousin Sophia put her handkerchief to her eyes pathetically, as if the world were indeed in terrible straits. As for Susan, Cousin Sophia was the salvation of her. She came to life with a jerk. "'Sophia Crawford, hold your peace,' she said sternly. "'You may be an idiot, but you need not be an irreverent idiot. It is no more than decent to be weeping and wailing, because the Almighty is the sole stay of the Allies now. As for Kitchener, his death is a great loss, and I do not dispute it. But the outcome of this war does not depend on one man's life, and now that the Russians are coming on again, you will soon see a change for the better." Susan said this so energetically that she convinced herself, and cheered up immediately. But Cousin Sophia shook her head. "'Albert's wife wants to call the baby after Brusilov,' she said but I told her to wait and see what becomes of him first. Them Russians has such a habit of petering out. The Russians are doing splendidly, however, and they have saved Italy. But even when the daily news of their sweeping advance comes, we don't feel like running up the flag as we used to do. As Gertrude says, Verdun has slain all exultation. We would all feel more like rejoicing if the victories were on the western front. When will the British strike? Gertrude sighed this morning. We have waited so long, so long. Our greatest local event in recent weeks was the route march the county battalion made through the county before it left for overseas. They marched from Charlottetown to Lowbridge, then round the Harbour Head and through the Upper Glen, and so down to the St. Mary Station. Everybody turned out to see them, except old Aunt Fanny Clough, who is bedridden, and Mr. Pryor, who hadn't been seen out even in church since the night of the Union prayer meeting the previous week. It was wonderful and heartbreaking to see that battalion marching past. There were young men and middle-aged men in it. There was Laurie McAllister from Over Harbour, who is only sixteen, but swore he was eighteen so that he could enlist. And there was Angus Mackenzie from the Upper Glen, who is fifty-five if he is a day, and swore he was forty-four. There were two South African veterans from Lowbridge, and the three eighteen-year-old Baxter triplets from Harbour Head. Everybody cheered as they went by and they cheered Foster Booth, who was forty, walking side by side with his son Charlie, who was twenty. Charlie's mother died when he was born, and when Charlie enlisted, Foster said he'd never yet let Charlie go anywhere he daren't go himself, 
and he didn't mean to begin with the Flanders trenches. At the station Dog Monday nearly went out of his head. He tore about and sent messages to Jem by them all. Mr. Meredith read an address, and Rita Crawford recited the piper. The soldiers cheered her like mad, and cried, "'We'll follow! We'll follow! We won't break faith!' and I felt so proud to think that it was my dear brother who had written such a wonderful, heart-stirring thing. And then I looked at the khaki ranks, and wondered if those tall fellows in uniform could be the boys I have laughed with, and played with, and danced with, and teased all my life. Something seems to have touched them and set them apart. They have heard the piper's call. Fred Arnold was in the battalion, and I felt dreadfully about him, for I realized that it was because of me that he was going away with such a sorrowful expression. I couldn't help it, but I felt as badly as if I could. The last evening of his leave Fred came up to Ingleside, and told me he loved me, and asked me if I would promise to marry him some day, if he ever came back. He was desperately in earnest, and I felt more wretched than I ever did in my life. I couldn't promise him that. Why, even if there was no question of Ken, I don't care for Fred that way, and never could. But it seemed so cruel and heartless to send him away to the front without any hope of comfort. I cried like a baby. And yet, oh, I'm afraid that there must be something incurably frivolous about me, because right in the middle of it all, with me crying and Fred looking so wild and tragic, the thought popped into my head that it would be an unendurable thing to see that nose across from me at the breakfast-table every morning of my life. There, that is one of the entries I wouldn't want my descendants to read in this journal. But it is the humiliating truth. And perhaps it's just as well that thought did come or I might have been tricked by pity and remorse into giving him some rash assurance. If Fred's nose were as handsome as his eyes and mouth, some such thing might have happened, and then what an unthinkable predicament I should have been in. When poor Fred became convinced that I couldn't promise him, he behaved beautifully, though that rather made things worse. If he had been nasty about it, I wouldn't have felt so heartbroken and remorseful, though why I should feel remorseful I don't know, for I never encouraged Fred to think I cared a bit about him yet feel remorseful I did, and do. If Fred Arnold never comes back from overseas, this will haunt me all my life. Then Fred said if he couldn't take my love with him to the trenches, at least he wanted to feel that he had my friendship, and would I kiss him just once in good-bye before he went, perhaps forever. I don't know how I could ever have imagined that love affairs were delightful, interesting things. They are horrible. I couldn't even give poor heart-broken Fred one little kiss because of my promise to Ken seemed so brutal. I had to tell Fred that of course he would have my friendship, but that I couldn't kiss him because I had promised somebody else I wouldn't. He said, "'It is—is is it Ken Ford?' I nodded. It seemed dreadful to have to tell it. It was such a sacred little secret just between me and Ken. When Fred went away I came up here to my room and cried so long and so bitterly that Mother came up and insisted on knowing what was the matter. I told her. She listened to my tale with an expression that clearly said, "'Can it be possible that anyone has been wanting to marry this baby?' But she was so nice and understanding and sympathetic—oh, just so race of Josephy, that I felt indescribably comforted. Mothers are the dearest things. "'But, oh, mother!' I sobbed. "'He wanted me to kiss him good-bye, and I couldn't, and that hurt me worse than all the rest.' "'Well, why didn't you kiss him?' asked Mother coolly. "'Considering the circumstances, I think you might have. "'But I couldn't, Mother. "'I promised Ken when he went away "'that I wouldn't kiss anybody else until he came back.' "'This was another high explosive for poor Mother. "'She exclaimed with the queerest little catch in her voice, "'Rilla, are you engaged to Kenneth Ford? "'I don't know!' I sobbed. "'You don't know?' repeated Mother. Then I had to tell her the whole story, too, and every time I tell it, it seems sillier and sillier to imagine that Ken meant anything serious. I felt idiotic and ashamed by the time I got through. Mother sat a little while in silence. Then she came over, sat down beside me, and took me in her arms. Don't cry, dear little Rilla, my Rilla. You have nothing to reproach yourself with in regard to Fred. And if Leslie West's son asks you to keep your lips for him, I think you may consider yourself engaged to him. But, oh, my baby, my last little baby, I have lost you. The war has made a woman of you too soon. I shall never be too much of a woman to find comfort in mother's hugs. Nevertheless, when I saw Fred marching by two days later in the parade, my heart ached unbearably. 
but I'm glad Mother thinks I'm really engaged to Ken. End of chapter 21 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Karen Savage, Waco, Texas, July 2006. Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 22 Little Dog Monday Knows. It is two years to night since the dance at the light when Jack Elliot brought us news of the war. Do you remember, Miss Oliver? Cousin Sophia answered for Miss Oliver. "'Oh, indeed, Rilla, I remember that evening only too well, and you are prancing down here to show off your party clothes. Didn't I warn you that we could not tell what was before us? Little did you think that night what was before you.' "'Little did any of us think that,' said Susan sharply, not being gifted with the power of prophecy. It does not require any great foresight, Sophia Crawford, to tell a body that she will have some trouble before her life is over. I could do as much myself.' "'We all thought the war would be over in a few months, then,' said Rilla, wistfully. "'When I look back it seems so ridiculous that we ever could have supposed it. "'And now, two years later, it is no nearer the end than it was then,' said Miss Oliver gloomily. Susan clicked her knitting-needles briskly. "'Now, Miss Oliver, dear, you know that is not a reasonable remark. "'You know we are just two years nearer the end, whenever the end is appointed to be.' Albert read in a Montreal paper today that a war expert gives it as his opinion that it will last five years more, was Cousin Sophia's cheerful contribution. "'It can't!' cried Rilla. Then she added with a sigh, Two years ago we would have said it can't last two years. But five more years of this? If Romania comes in, as I have strong hopes now of her doing, you will see the end in five months instead of five years,' said Susan. "'I've no faith in foreigners.' sighed Cousin Sophia. "'The French are foreigners,' retorted Susan, "'and look at Verdun. And think of all the Somme victories this blessed summer. The big push is on, and the Russians are still doing well. Why, General Haig says that the German officers he has captured admit that they have lost the war.' "'You can't believe a word the Germans say,' protested Cousin Sophia. "'There is no sense in believing a thing just because you'd like to believe it, Susan Baker. The British have lost millions of men at the Somme, and how far have they got?' Look facts in the face, Susan Baker, look facts in the face. They are wearing the Germans out, and so long as that happens, it does not matter whether it is done a few miles east or a few miles west. I am not, admitted Susan, in tremendous humility. I am not a military expert, Sophia Crawford, but even I can see that, and so could you if you were not determined to take a gloomy view of everything. The Huns have not got all the cleverness in the world. Have you not heard the story of Alistair McCallum's son Roderick from the Upper Glen? He is a prisoner in Germany, and his mother got a letter from him last week. He wrote that he was being very kindly treated, and that all the prisoners have plenty of food and so on, till you would have supposed everything was lovely. But when he signed his name, right in between Roderick and McCallum, he wrote two Gaelic words that meant all lies, and the German censor did not understand Gaelic, and thought it was all part of Roddy's name. So he let it pass, never dreaming how he was diddled. Well, I am going to leave the war to Hague for the rest of the day, and make a frosting for my chocolate cake. And when it is made, I shall put it on the top shelf. The last one I made, I left it on the lower shelf, and little Kitchener sneaked in and clawed all the icing off and ate it. We had company for tea that night, and when I went to get my cake, what a sight did I behold! "'Has that poor orphan's father never been heard from yet?' asked Cousin Sophia. "'Yes, I had a letter from him in July,' said Rilla. He said that when he got word of his wife's death, and of my taking the baby—Mr. Meredith wrote him, you know—he wrote right away, but as he never got any answer, he had begun to think his letter must have been lost. "'It took him two years to begin to think it,' said Susan scornfully. "'Some people think very slow. Jim Anderson has not got a scratch, for all that he has been two years in the trenches. A fool for luck, as the old proverb says. "'He wrote very nicely about Jim's, and said he'd like to see him,' said Rilla. So I wrote and told him all about the wee man, and sent him snapshots. Jim's will be two years old next week, and he is a perfect duck. "'You didn't used to be very fond of babies,' said Cousin Sophia. "'I'm not a bit fonder of babies in the abstract than ever I was,' said Rilla, frankly. "'But I do love Jim's, and I'm afraid I wasn't really half as glad as I should have been when Jim Anderson's letter proved that he was safe and sound. "'You wasn't hoping the man would be killed!' cried Cousin Sophia in horrified accents. "'No, no, no, no! 
"'I just hoped he would go on forgetting about Jims, Mrs. Crawford.' "'And then your pa would have the expense of raising him,' said Cousin Sophia reprovingly. "'You young creatures are terrible thoughtless.' Jims himself ran in at this juncture, so rosy and curly and kissable that he extorted a qualified compliment even from Cousin Sophia. "'He's a real healthy-looking child now, though maybe his colour is a mite too high. Sorter consumptive-looking, as you might say. I never thought you'd raise him when I saw him the day after you brung him home. I really did not think it was in you, and I told Albert's wife so when I got home. Albert's wife says, says she, "'There's more in Rilla Blythe than you'd think for, Aunt Sophia.' them was her very words. More in Rilla Blythe than you'd think for. Albert's wife always had a good opinion of you." Cousin Sophia sighed, as if to imply that Albert's wife stood alone in this against the world. But Cousin Sophia really did not mean that. She was quite fond of Rilla in her own melancholy way. But young creatures had to be kept down. If they were not kept down, society would be demoralized. "'Do you remember your walk home from the light two years ago to-night?' whispered Gertrude Oliver to Rilla teasingly. "'I should think so,' smiled Rilla. And then her smile grew dreamy and absent. She was remembering something else, that hour with Kenneth on the sandshore. Where would Ken be to-night? And Jem and Jerry and Walter and all the other boys who had danced and moonlighted on the old Four Winds Point that evening of mirth and laughter, their last joyous, unclouded evening. In the filthy trenches of the Somme front, with the roar of the guns and the groans of stricken men for the music of Ned Burr's violin, and the flash of star-shells for the silver sparkles on the old blue gulf. Two of them were sleeping under the Flanders poppies, Alec Burr from the Upper Glen, and Clark Manley of Lowbridge. Others were wounded in the hospitals. But so far, nothing had touched the manse and the Ingleside boys. They seemed to bear charmed lives. Yet the suspense never grew any easier to bear, as the weeks and months of war went by. It isn't as if it were some sort of fever to which you might conclude they were immune when they hadn't taken it for two years," sighed Rilla. The danger is just as great and just as real as it was the first day they went into the trenches. I know this, and it tortures me every day. And yet I can't help hoping that since they've come this far unhurt they'll come through. Oh, Miss Oliver! What would it be like not to wake up in the morning feeling afraid of the news the day would bring? I can't picture such a state of things somehow, and two years ago this morning I woke up wondering what delightful gift the new day would give me. These are the two years I thought would be filled with fun. Would you exchange them, now, for two years filled with fun?" No," said Rilla slowly. I wouldn't. It's strange, isn't it? They have been two terrible years. And yet I have a queer feeling of thankfulness for them, as if they had brought me something very precious with all their pain. I wouldn't want to go back and be the girl I was two years ago, not even if I could. Not that I think I've made any wonderful progress, but I'm not quite the selfish, frivolous little doll I was then. I suppose I had a soul then, Miss Oliver, but I didn't know it. I know it now, and that is worth a great deal, worth all the suffering of the past two years. And still, Rilla gave a little apologetic laugh, I don't want to suffer any more, not even for the sake of more soul growth. At the end of two more years I might look back and be thankful for the development they had brought me to, but I don't want it now. We never do, said Miss Oliver. That is why we are not left to choose our own means and measure of development, I suppose. No matter how much we value what our lessons have brought us, we don't want to go on with the bitter schooling. Well, let us hope for the best, as Susan says. Things are really going well now, and if Romania lines up, the end may come with a suddenness that will surprise us all. Romania did come in, and Susan remarked approvingly that its king and queen were the finest-looking royal couple she had seen pictures of. So the summer passed away. Early in September word came that the Canadians had been shifted to the Somme front, and anxiety grew tenser and deeper. For the first time Mrs. Blythe's spirit failed her a little, and as the days of suspense wore on the doctor began to look gravely at her, and veto this or that special effort in Red Cross work. "'Oh, let me work! Let me work, Gilbert!' she entreated feverishly. "'While I'm working I don't think so much. If I'm idle I imagine everything. Rest is only torture for me. My two boys are on the frightful Somme front, and Shirley pours day and night over aviation literature and says nothing. But I see the purpose growing in his eyes. No, I cannot rest. Don't ask it of me, Gilbert.' But the doctor was inexorable. 
"'I can't let you kill yourself, Anne girl,' he said. "'When the boys come back, I want a mother here to welcome them. "'Why, you're getting transparent. It won't do. "'Ask Susan there if it will do.' "'Oh, if Susan and you are both banded together against me,' said Anne helplessly. One day the glorious news came that the Canadians had taken Corselet and Martin Puiche, with many prisoners and guns. Susan ran up the flag and said it was plain to be seen that Haig knew what soldiers to pick for a hard job. The others dared not feel exultant. Who knew what price had been paid? Rilla woke that morning when the dawn was beginning to break, and went to her window to look out her thick, creamy eyelids heavy with sleep. Just at dawn the world looks as it never looks at any other time. The air was cold with dew, and the orchard and grove and rainbow valley were full of mystery and wonder. Over the eastern hill were golden deeps and silvery pink shallows. There was no wind, and Rilla heard distinctly a dog howling in a melancholy way down in the direction of the station. Was it Dog Monday? And if it were, why was he howling like that? Rilla shivered. The sound had something boding and grievous in it. She remembered that Miss Oliver said once, when they were coming home in the darkness and heard a dog howl, "'When a dog cries like that, the angel of death is passing.' Rilla listened with a curdling fear at her heart. It was Dog Monday. She felt sure of it. Whose dirge was he howling? To whose spirit was he sending that anguished greeting and farewell? Rilla went back to bed, but she could not sleep. All day she watched and waited in a dread of which she did not speak to anyone. She went down to see Dog Monday, and the station-master said, "'That dog o' yours howled from midnight to sunrise, something weird. I don't know what got into him. I got up once and went out and hollered at him, but he paid no attention to me. He was sitting all alone in the moonlight out there at the end of the platform, and every few minutes the poor lonely little beggar would lift his nose and howl as if his heart was breaking. He never did it afore. He always slept in his kennel, real quiet and canny from train to train. But he sure had something on his mind last night. Dog Monday was lying in his kennel. He wagged his tail and licked Rilla's hand. But he would not touch the food she brought for him. "'I'm afraid he's sick,' she said anxiously. She hated to go away and leave him. But no bad news came that day, nor the next, nor the next. Rilla's fear lifted. Dog Monday howled no more and resumed his routine of train-meeting and watching. When five days had passed, the Ingleside people began to feel that they might be cheerful again. Rilla dashed about the kitchen, helping Susan with the breakfast, and singing so sweetly and clearly that Cousin Sophia across the road heard her and croaked out to Mrs. Albert, "'Sing before eatin', cry before sleepin', I have always heard.' But Rilla Blythe shed no tears before the nightfall. When her father, his face grey and drawn and old, came to her that afternoon, and told her that Walter had been killed in action at Corselet, she crumpled up in a pitiful little heap of merciful unconsciousness in his arms. Nor did she awaken to her pain for many hours. End of chapter 22 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Karen Savage, Waco, Texas, July 2006 Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery Chapter 23 And so, good night. The fierce flame of agony had burned itself out, and the grey dust of its ashes was over all the world. Rilla's younger life recovered physically sooner than her mother. For weeks Mrs. Blythe lay ill from grief and shock. Rilla found it was possible to go on with existence, since existence had still to be reckoned with. There was work to be done, for Susan could not do all. For her mother's sake she had to put on calmness and endurance as a garment in the day. But night after night she lay in her bed, weeping the bitter rebellious tears of youth, until at last tears were all wept out, and the little patient ache that was to be in her heart until she died took their place. She clung to Miss Oliver, who knew what to say and what not to say. So few people did. Kind, well-meaning callers and comforters gave Rilla some terrible moments. "'You'll get over it in time,' Mrs. William Reese said cheerfully. Mrs. Reese had three stalwart sons, not one of whom had gone to the front." "'It's such a blessing it was Walter who was taken, and not Jem,' said Miss Sarah Clow. "'Walter was a member of the church, and Jem wasn't. "'I've told Mr. Meredith many a time that he should have spoken seriously to Jem about it before he went away.' "'Poor, poor Walter,' sighed Mrs. Reese. "'Do not you come here calling him poor Walter,' 
said Susan indignantly, appearing in the kitchen door much to the relief of Rilla, who felt that she could endure no more just then. He was not poor. He was richer than any of you. It is you who stay at home and will not let your sons go who are poor. Poor and naked and mean and small. Pison poor. And so are your sons with all their prosperous farms and fat cattle, and their souls no bigger than a flea's, if as big. I came here to comfort the afflicted and not to be insulted, said Mrs. Reese, taking her departure, unregretted by any one. Then the fire went out of Susan, and she retreated to her kitchen, laid her faithful old head on the table, and wept bitterly for a time. Then she went to work and ironed Jim's little rompers. Rilla scolded her gently for it when she herself came in to do it. I am not going to have you kill yourself working for any war baby, Susan said obstinately. "'Oh, I wish I could just keep on working all the time, Susan,' cried poor Rilla. "'And I wish I didn't have to go to sleep. "'It is hideous to go to sleep and forget it for a little while, "'and wake up and have it all rush over me anew the next morning. "'Do people ever get used to things like this, Susan? "'And, oh, Susan, I can't get away from what Mrs. Reese said. "'Did Walter suffer much? "'He was always so sensitive to pain. "'Oh, Susan, if I knew that he didn't, "'I think I could gather up a little courage and strength.' This merciful knowledge was given to Rilla. A letter came from Walter's commanding officer, telling them that he had been killed instantly by a bullet during a charge at Corselet. The same day there was a letter for Rilla from Walter himself. Rilla carried it unopened to Rainbow Valley and read it there, in the spot where she had had her last talk with him. It is a strange thing to read a letter after the writer is dead, a bittersweet thing, in which pain and comfort are strangely mingled. For the first time since the blow had fallen, Rilla felt a different thing from tremulous hope and faith, that Walter, of the glorious gift and the splendid ideals, still lived, with just the same gift and just the same ideals. That could not be destroyed. These could suffer no eclipse. The personality that had expressed itself in that last letter, written on the eve of Corselet, could not be snuffed out by a German bullet. It must carry on, though the earthly link with things of earth were broken. "'We're going over the top tomorrow, Rilla, my Rilla,' wrote Walter. "'I wrote Mother and I yesterday, but somehow I feel as if I must write you tonight. "'I hadn't intended to do any writing tonight, but I've got to. "'Do you remember old Mrs. Tom Crawford over Harbour, "'who was always saying that it was laid on her to do such and such a thing? "'Well, that is just how I feel. "'It's laid on me to write you tonight, you sister and chum of mine. "'There are some things I want to say before—well, before tomorrow. You and Ingleside seem strangely near me tonight. It's the first time I've felt this since I came. Always home has seemed so far away, so hopelessly far away from this hideous welter of filth and blood. But tonight it is quite close to me, and it seems to me I can almost see you, hear you speak. And I can see the moonlight shining white and still on the old hills of home. It has seemed to me ever since I came here that it was impossible that there could be calm, gentle nights and unshattered moonlight anywhere in the world. But tonight, somehow, all the beautiful things I have always loved seem to have become possible again. And this is good, and makes me feel a deep, certain, exquisite happiness. It must be autumn at home now. The harbour is a dream, and the old Glen Hills blue with haze, and Rainbow Valley a haunt of delight with wild asters blowing all over it. Our old farewell summers. I always liked that name better than Aster. It was a poem in itself. Rilla, you know I've always had premonitions. You remember the Pied Piper. But no, of course you wouldn't. You were too young. One evening long ago, when Nan and Di and Jem and the Merediths and I were together in Rainbow Valley, I had a queer vision or presentiment, whatever you like to call it. Rilla, I saw the Piper coming down the valley with a shadowy host behind him. The others thought I was only pretending, but I saw him for just one moment. And Rilla, last night I saw him again— I was doing sentry-go, and I saw him marching across no man's land from our trenches to the German trenches, the same tall shadowy form piping weirdly, and behind him followed boys in khaki. Rilla, I tell you I saw him. It was no fancy, no illusion. I heard his music, and then he was gone. But I had seen him, and I knew what it meant. I knew that I was among those who followed him. Rilla, the piper will pipe me west to-morrow. I feel sure of this, and Rilla, I'm not afraid. When you hear the news, remember that. I've won my own freedom here, freedom from all fear. I shall never be afraid of anything again. 
not of death, nor of life, if, after all, I am to go on living. And life, I think, would be the harder of the two to face, for it could never be beautiful for me again. There would always be such horrible things to remember, things that would make life ugly and painful always for me. I could never forget them. But whether it's life or death, I am not afraid, Rilla my Rilla, and I am not sorry that I came. I'm satisfied. I'll never write the poems I once dreamed of writing, but I've helped to make Canada safe for the poets of the future, for the workers of the future, ay, and the dreamers, too, for if no man dreams there will be nothing for the workers to fulfill. The future, not of Canada only, but of the world, when the red rain of Langemark and Verdun shall have brought forth a golden harvest, not in a year or two, as some foolishly think, but a generation later, when the seed sown now shall have had time to germinate and grow. Yes, I'm glad I came, Rilla. It isn't only the fate of the little sea-born island I love that is in the balance, nor of Canada, nor of England. It's the fate of mankind. That is what we're fighting for. And we shall win. Never for a moment doubt that, Rilla. For it isn't only the living who are fighting. The dead are fighting, too. Such an army cannot be defeated. Is there laughter in your face yet, Rilla? I hope so. The world will need laughter and courage more than ever in the years that will come next. I don't want to preach. This isn't any time for it. But I just want to say something that may help you over the worst when you hear that I've gone west. I've a premonition about you, Rilla, as well as about myself. I think Ken will go back to you, and that there are long years of happiness for you by and by. And you will teach your children of the idea we fought and died for. Teach them it must be lived for as well as died for, else the price paid for it will have been given for naught. This will be part of your work, Rilla. And if you, all of you girls back in the homeland, do it, then we who don't come back will know that you have not broken faith with us. I meant to write to Una tonight, too, but I won't have time now. Read this letter to her and tell her it's really meant for both of you, you two dear, fine, loyal girls. Tomorrow, when we go over the top, I'll think of you both, of your laughter, Rilla my Rilla, and the steadfastness in Una's blue eyes. Somehow I see those eyes very plainly tonight, too. Yes, you'll both keep faith. I'm sure of that. You and Una. And so, good night. We go over the top at dawn. Rilla read her letter over many times. There was a new light on her pale young face when she finally stood up amid the asters Walter had loved, with the sunshine of autumn around her. For the moment, at least, she was lifted above pain and loneliness. I will keep faith, Walter, she said steadily. I will work, and teach, and learn, and laugh. Yes, I will even laugh, through all my years, because of you and because of what you gave when you followed the call. Rilla meant to keep Walter's letter as a sacred treasure, but seeing the look on Una Meredith's face when Una had read it and held it back to her, she thought of something. Could she do it? Oh, no, she could not give up Walter's letter, his last letter. Surely it was not selfishness to keep it. A copy would be such a soulless thing. But Una, Una had so little, and her eyes were the eyes of a woman stricken to the heart, who yet must not cry out or ask for sympathy. Una, would you like to have this letter? To keep? she asked slowly. Yes, if you can give it to me, Una said dully. Then you may have it, said Rilla hurriedly. Thank you, said Una. It was all she said, but there was something in her voice which repaid Rilla for her bit of sacrifice. Una took the letter, and when Rilla had gone she pressed it against her lonely lips. Una knew that love would never come into her life now. It was buried forever under the blood-stained soil somewhere in France. No one but herself, and perhaps Rilla, knew it, would ever know it. She had no right in the eyes of her world to grieve. She must hide and bear her long pain as best she could, alone. But she too would keep faith. End of chapter twenty three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Karen Savage, Waco, Texas, July two thousand and six. Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter twenty four. Mary is just in time. The autumn of nineteen sixteen was a bitter season for Ingleside. Mrs. Blythe's return to health was slow, and sorrow and loneliness were in all hearts. Everyone tried to hide it from the others and carry on cheerfully. Rilla laughed a good deal. 
Nobody at Ingleside was deceived by her laughter. It came from her lips only, never from her heart. But outsiders said some people got over trouble very easily, and Irene Howard remarked that she was surprised to find how shallow Rilla Blythe really was. Why, after all her pose of being so devoted to Walter, she doesn't seem to mind his death at all. Nobody has ever seen her shed a tear or heard her mention his name. She has evidently quite forgotten him. Poor fellow! You'd really think his family would feel it more. I spoke of him to Rilla at the last junior red meeting, of how fine and brave and splendid he was, and I said life could never be just the same to me again, now that Walter had gone. We were such friends, you know. Why, I was the very first person he told about having enlisted, and Rilla answered as coolly and indifferently as if she were speaking of an entire stranger. He was just one of many fine and splendid boys who have given everything for their country. Well, I wish I could take things as calmly, but I am not made like that. I'm so sensitive. Things hurt me terribly. I really never get over them. I asked Rilla right out why she didn't put on mourning for Walter. She said her mother didn't wish it. But everyone is talking about it. Rilla doesn't wear colors. Nothing but white, protested Betty Mead. White becomes her better than anything else, said Irene significantly. And we all know black doesn't suit her complexion at all. But of course I'm not saying that is the reason she doesn't wear it. Only it's funny. If my brother had died, I'd have gone into deep mourning. I wouldn't have had the heart for anything else. I confess I'm disappointed in Rilla Blythe. I am not, then," cried Betty Mead, loyally. I think Rilla is just a wonderful girl. A few years ago I admit I did think she was rather too vain and gigglesome. But now she is nothing of the sort. I don't think there is a girl in the Glen who is so unselfish and plucky as Rilla, or who has done her bit as thoroughly and patiently. Our junior Red Cross would have gone on the rocks a dozen times if it hadn't been for her tact and perseverance and enthusiasm. You know that perfectly well, Irene." "'Why, I'm not running Rilla down,' said Irene, opening her eyes widely. It was only her lack of feeling I was criticizing. I suppose she can't help it. Of course she's a born manager. Everyone knows that. She's very fond of managing, too, and people like that are very necessary, I admit. So don't look at me as if I'd said something perfectly dreadful, Betty, please. I'm quite willing to agree that Rilla Blythe is the embodiment of all the virtues, if that will please you. And no doubt it is a virtue to be quite unmoved by things that would crush most people." Some of Irene's remarks were reported to Rilla, but they did not hurt her as they would once have done. They didn't matter, that was all. Life was too big to leave room for pettiness. She had a pact to keep and work to do. And through the long, hard days and weeks of that disastrous autumn she was faithful to her task. The war news was consistently bad, for Germany marched from victory to victory over poor Romania. Foreigners, foreigners, Susan muttered dubiously. Russians or Romanians or whatever they may be, they are foreigners and you cannot tie to them. But after Verdun I shall not give up hope. And can you tell me, Mrs. Dr. dear, if the Dobruja is a river or a mountain range or a condition of the atmosphere? The presidential election in the United States came off in November, and Susan was red-hot over that, and quite apologetic for her excitement. I never thought I would live to see the day when I would be interested in a Yankee election, Mrs. Dr. dear. It only goes to show that we can never know what we will come to in this world, and therefore we should not be proud. Susan stayed up late on the evening of the 11th, ostensibly to finish a pair of socks. But she phoned down to Carter Flagg's store at intervals, and when the first report came through that Hughes had been elected, she stalked solemnly upstairs to Mrs. Blythe's room and announced it in a thrilling whisper from the foot of the bed. "'I thought if you were not asleep you would be interested in knowing it. I believe it is for the best. Perhaps he will just fall to writing notes, too, Mrs. Dr. dear, but I hope for better things. I was never partial to whiskers, but one cannot have everything.' When news came in the morning that, after all, Wilson was re-elected, Susan tacked to catch another breeze of optimism. "'Well, better a fool you know than a fool you do not know, as the old proverb has it,' she remarked cheerfully. "'Not that I hold Woodrow to be a fool by any means, though by times you would not think he has the sense he was born with. But he is a good letter-writer, at least, and we do not know if the Hughes man is even that. All things being considered, I commend the Yankees. They have shown good sense, and I do not mind admitting it. Cousin Sophia wanted them to elect Roosevelt, and is much disgruntled because they would not give him a chance. I had a hankering for him myself, but we must believe that Providence overrules these matters and be satisfied, though what the Almighty means in this affair of Romania I cannot fathom, saying it with all reverence. Susan fathomed it, or thought she did, when the Asquith Ministry went down and Lloyd George became Premier. 
Mrs. Dr. dear, Lloyd George is at the helm at last. I have been praying for this for many a day. Now we shall soon see a blessed change. It took the Romanian disaster to bring it about, no less, and that is the meaning of it, though I could not see it before. There will be no more shilly-shallying. I consider that the war is as good as won, and that I shall tie to, whether Bucharest falls or not. Bucharest did fall, and Germany proposed peace negotiations, whereat Susan scornfully turned a deaf ear and absolutely refused to listen to such proposals. When President Wilson sent his famous December peace note, Susan waxed violently sarcastic. Woodrow Wilson is going to make peace, I understand. First Henry Ford had a try at it, and now comes Wilson. But peace is not made with ink, Woodrow, and that you may tie to, said Susan, apostrophizing the unlucky president out of the kitchen window nearest the United States. Lloyd George's speech will tell the Kaiser what is what. And you may keep your peace screeds at home and save postage. What a pity President Wilson can't hear you, Susan, said Rilla slyly. Indeed, Rilla dear, it is a pity that he has no one near him to give him good advice, as it is clear he has not, in all those Democrats and Republicans, retorted Susan. I do not know the difference between them, for the politics of the Yankees is a puzzle I cannot solve, study it as I may. But as far as seeing through a grindstone goes, I am afraid—Susan shook her head dubiously—that they are all tarred with the same brush. I am thankful Christmas is over, Rilla wrote in her diary during the last week of a stormy December. We had dreaded it so, the first Christmas since Corselet. But we had all the Merediths down for dinner, and nobody tried to be gay or cheerful. We were all just quiet and friendly, and that helped. Then, too, I was so thankful that Jims had got better, so thankful that I almost felt glad. Almost, but not quite. I wonder if I shall ever feel really glad over anything again. It seems as if gladness were killed in me, shot down by the same bullet that pierced Walter's heart. Perhaps some day a new kind of gladness will be born in my soul, but the old kind will never live again. Winter set in awfully early this year. Ten days before Christmas we had a big snowstorm. At least we thought it big at the time. As it happened, it was only a prelude to the real performance. It was fine the next day, and Ingleside and Rainbow Valley were wonderful, with the trees all covered in snow and big drifts everywhere, carved into the most fantastic shapes by the chisel of the northeast wind. Father and mother went up to Avonlea. Father thought the change would do mother good, and they wanted to see poor Aunt Diana, whose son Jack had been seriously wounded a short time before. They left Susan and me to keep house, and father expected to be back the next day. But he never got back for a week. That night it began to storm again, and it stormed unbrokenly for four days. It was the worst and longest storm that Prince Edward Island has known for years. Everything was disorganized. The roads were completely choked up, the trains blockaded, and the telephone wires put entirely out of commission. And then Jims took ill. He had a little cold when father and mother went away, and he kept getting worse for a couple of days, but it didn't occur to me that there was danger of anything serious. I never even took his temperature, and I can't forgive myself, because it was sheer carelessness. The truth is, I had slumped just then. Mother was away, so I let myself go. All at once I was tired of keeping up and pretending to be brave and cheerful, and I just gave up for a few days and spent most of the time lying on my face on my bed, crying. I neglected Jims. That is the hateful truth. I was cowardly and false to what I promised Walter, and if Jims had died I could never have forgiven myself. Then, the third night after father and mother went away, Jim suddenly got worse—oh, so much worse—all at once. Susan and I were all alone. Gertrude had been at Lowbridge when the storm began, and had never got back. At first we were not much alarmed. Jim's has had several bouts of croup, and Susan and Morgan and I have always brought him through without much trouble. But it wasn't very long before we were dreadfully alarmed. "'I never saw croup like this before,' said Susan. As for me, I knew, when it was too late, what kind of croup it was. I knew it was not the ordinary croup—false croup, as doctors call it—but the true croup, and I knew it was a deadly and dangerous thing. And father was away, and there was no doctor nearer than Lowbridge, and we could not phone, and neither horse nor man could get through the drifts that night. Gallant little Jims put up a good fight for his life. Susan and I tried every remedy we could think of or find in father's books, but he continued to grow worse. It was heart-rending to see and hear him. He gasped so horribly for breath—the poor little soul and his face turned a dreadful bluish color and had such an agonized expression, and he kept struggling with his little hands as if he were appealing to us to help him somehow. I found myself thinking that the boys who had been gassed at the front must have looked like that, and the thought haunted me, amid all my dread and misery over Jim's. 
and all the time the fatal membrane in his wee throat grew and thickened, and he couldn't get it up. Oh, I was just wild. I never realized how dear Jims was to me until that moment, and I felt so utterly helpless. And then Susan gave up. We cannot save him. Oh, if your father was here! Look at him, the poor little fellow. I know not what to do. I looked at Jims, and I thought he was dying. Susan was holding him up in his crib to give him a better chance for breath, but it didn't seem as if he could breathe at all. My little war baby, with his dear ways and sweet roguish face, was choking to death before my very eyes, and I couldn't help him. I threw down the hot poultice I had ready in despair. Of what use was it? Jims was dying, and it was my fault. I hadn't been careful enough. Just then, at eleven o'clock at night, the doorbell rang. Such a ring! It pealed all over the house above the roar of the storm. Susan couldn't go. She dared not lay Jims down, so I rushed downstairs. In the hall I paused just a minute. I was suddenly overcome by an absurd dread. I thought of a weird story Gertrude had told me once. An aunt of hers was alone in a house one night with her sick husband. She heard a knock at the door, and when she went and opened it, there was nothing there. Nothing that could be seen, at least. But when she opened the door, a deadly cold wind blew in and seemed to sweep past her right up the stairs, although it was a calm, warm summer night outside. Immediately she heard a cry. She ran upstairs, and her husband was dead. And she always believed, so Gertrude said, that when she opened that door she let death in. It was so ridiculous of me to feel so frightened, but I was distracted and worn out, and I simply felt for a moment that I dared not open the door, that death was waiting outside. Then I remembered that I had no time to waste, must not be so foolish. I sprang forward and opened the door. Certainly a cold wind did blow in and filled the hall with a whirl of snow, but there on the threshold stood a form of flesh and blood. Mary Vance, coated from head to foot with snow, and she brought life, not death, with her, though I didn't know that then. I just stared at her. I haven't been turned out, grinned Mary as she stepped in and shut the door. I came up to Carter Flagg's two days ago, and I've been storm stayed there ever since. But old Abby Flagg got on my nerves at last, and tonight I just made up my mind to come up here. I thought I could wait this far, but I can tell you it was as much as a bargain. Once I thought I was stuck for keeps. Ain't it an awful night? I came to myself, and I knew I must hurry upstairs. I explained as quickly as I could to Mary, and left her trying to brush the snow off. Upstairs I found that Jims was over that paroxysm, but almost as soon as I got back to the room he was in the grip of another. I couldn't do anything but moan and cry. Oh, how ashamed I am when I think of it! And yet what could I do? We had tried everything we knew. And then all at once I heard Mary Vance saying loudly behind me, Why, that child is dying! I whirled around. Didn't I know he was dying? My little Jims! I could have thrown Mary Vance out of the door or the window, anywhere at that moment. There she stood, cool and composed, looking down at my baby with those weird white eyes of hers as she might look at a choking kitten. I had always disliked Mary Vance, and just then I hated her. We have tried everything, said poor Susan dully. It is not ordinary croup. No, it's the diphtheria croup, said Mary briskly, snatching up an apron, and there's mighty little time to lose, but I know what to do. When I lived over harbor with Mrs. Wiley years ago, Will Crawford's kid died of diphtheri croup in spite of two doctors, and when old Aunt Christina McAllister heard of it, she was the one brought me around when I nearly died of pneumonia, you know. She was a wonder. No doctor was a patch on her. They don't hatch her breed of cats nowadays, let me tell you. She said she could have saved him with her grandmother's remedy if she'd been there. She told Mrs. Wiley what it was, and I've never forgot it. I have the greatest memory ever. A thing just lies in the back of my head till the time comes to use it. Got any sulphur in the house, Susan? Yes, we had sulphur. Susan went down with Mary to get it, and I held Jim's. I hadn't any hope, not the least. Mary Vance might brag as she liked. She was always bragging, but I didn't believe any grandmother's remedy could save Jim's now. Presently Mary came back. She had tied a piece of thick flannel over her mouth and nose, and she carried Susan's old tin chip pan, half full of burning coals. You watch me, she said boastfully. I've never done this, but it's kill or cure. That child is dying anyway. She sprinkled a spoonful of sulphur over the coals, and then she picked up Jim's, turned him over, and held him face downward right over those choking, blinding fumes. I don't know why I didn't spring forward and snatch him away. Susan says it was because it was foreordained that I shouldn't, and I think she is right, because it did really seem that I was powerless to move. Susan herself seemed transfixed, watching Mary from the doorway. Jim's writhed in those big, firm, capable hands of Mary. Oh, yes, she is capable, all right, and choked, and wheezed, and choked, and wheezed, and I felt that he was being tortured to death. And then, all at once, after what seemed to me an hour, though it really wasn't long, he coughed up the membrane that was killing him. 
Mary turned him over and laid him back on his bed. He was white as marble, and the tears were pouring out of his brown eyes. But that awful, livid look was gone from his face, and he could breathe quite easily. Wasn't that some trick? said Mary gaily. I hadn't any idea how it would work, but I just took a chance. I'll smoke his throat out again once or twice before morning, just to kill all the germs. But you'll see, he'll be all right now. Jims went right to sleep, real sleep, not coma as I feared at first. Mary smoked him, as she called it, twice through the night, and at daylight his throat was perfectly clear, and his temperature was almost normal. When I made sure of that, I turned and looked at Mary Vance. She was sitting on the lounge, laying down the law to Susan on some subject about which Susan must have known forty times as much as she did. But I didn't mind how much law she laid down, or how much she bragged. She had a right to brag. She had dared to do what I would never have dared, and had saved Jims from a horrible death. It didn't matter any more that she had once chased me through the glen with a codfish. It didn't matter that she had smeared goose grease all over my dream of romance the night of the lighthouse dance. It didn't matter that she thought she knew more than anybody else and always rubbed it in. I would never dislike Mary Vance again. I went over to her and kissed her. What's up now? she said. Nothing. Only I'm so grateful to you, Mary. Well, I think you ought to be, that's a fact. You two would have let that baby die on your hands if I hadn't happened along, said Mary, just beaming with complacency. She got Susan and me a tip top breakfast and made us eat it, and bossed the life out of us, as Susan said, for two days, until the roads were open so that she could get home. Jims was almost well by that time, and father turned up. He heard our tale without saying much. Father is rather scornful generally about what he calls old wives' remedies. He laughed a little and said, After this, Mary Vance will expect me to call her in for consultation in all my serious cases. So Christmas was not so hard as I expected it to be. And now the new year is coming, and we are still hoping for the big push that will end the war. And little Dog Monday is getting stiff and rheumatic from his cold vigils. But still he carries on, and surely continues to read the exploits of the aces. Oh, 1917, what will you bring? End of chapter 24. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Karen Savage, Waco, Texas, July 2006. Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 25 Shirley Goes. No, Woodrow, there will be no peace without victory, said Susan, sticking her knitting needle viciously through President Wilson's name in the newspaper column. We Canadians mean to have peace and victory, too. You, if it pleases you, Woodrow, can have the peace without the victory. And Susan stalked off to bed with the comfortable consciousness of having got the better of the argument with the President. But a few days later she rushed to Mrs. Blythe in red-hot excitement. Mrs. Doctor, dear, what do you think? A phone message has just come through from Charlottetown that Woodrow Wilson has sent that German ambassador man to the right about at last. They tell me that means war. So I begin to think that Woodrow's heart is in the right place after all, wherever his head may be, and I am going to commandeer a little sugar and celebrate the occasion with some fudge, despite the howls of the food board. I thought that submarine business would bring things to a crisis. I told Cousin Sophia so when she said it was the beginning of the end for the Allies. Don't let the doctor hear of the fudge, Susan, said Anne with a smile. You know he has laid down very strict rules for us along the lines of economy the government has asked for. Yes, Mrs. Dr. dear, and a man should be master in his own household, and his women folk should bow to his degrees. I flatter myself that I am becoming quite efficient in economizing. Susan had taken to using certain German terms with killing effect. But one can exercise a little gumption on the quiet now and then. Shirley was wishing for some of my fudge the other day, the Susan brand, as he called it, and I said, The first victory there is to celebrate I shall make you some. I consider this news quite equal to a victory, and what the doctor does not know will never grieve him. I take the whole responsibility, Mrs. Doctor dear, so do not you vex your conscience. Susan spoiled Shirley shamelessly that winter. He came home from Queen's every weekend, and Susan had all his favorite dishes for him, in so far as she could evade or wheedle the doctor, and waited on him hand and foot. Though she talked war constantly to every one else, she never mentioned it to him or before him, but she watched him like a cat watching a mouse. And when the German retreat from the Bapaume salient began and continued, Susan's exultation was linked up with something deeper than anything she expressed. Surely the end was in sight, would come now before any one else could go. Things are coming our way at last. We have got the Germans on the run, she boasted. The United States has declared war at last, as I always believed they would, in spite of Woodrow's gift for letter writing, and you will see that they will go into it with a vim, since I understand that is their habit when they do start. 
and we have got the Germans on the run, too. The States mean well, moaned Cousin Sophia, but all the vim in the world cannot put them on the fighting line this spring, and the Allies will be finished before that. The Germans are just luring them on. That man Simmons says their retreat has put the Allies in a hole. That man Simmons has said more than he will ever live to make good, retorted Susan. I do not worry myself about his opinion as long as Lloyd George is Premier of England. He will not be bamboozled, and that you may tie to. Things look good to me. The U.S. is in the war, and we have got Kut and Baghdad back. And I would not be surprised to see the Allies in Berlin by June, and the Russians, too, since they have got rid of the Tsar. That, in my opinion, was a good piece of work. Time will show if it is, said Cousin Sophia, who would have been very indignant if any one had told her that she would rather see Susan put to shame as a seer than a successful overthrow of tyranny, or even the march of the Allies down Unter der Linden. But then the woes of the Russian people were quite unknown to Cousin Sophia, while this aggravating, optimistic Susan was an ever-present thorn in her side. Just at that moment, Shirley was sitting on the edge of the table in the living room, swinging his legs, a brown, ruddy, wholesome lad from top to toe, every inch of him, and saying coolly, "'Mother and Dad, I was eighteen last Monday. Don't you think it's about time I joined up?' The pale mother looked at him. Two of my sons have gone, and one will never return. Must I give you two, Shirley? The age-old cry, Joseph is not, and Simeon is not, and you will take Benjamin away. How the mothers of the great war echoed the old patriarch's moan of so many centuries agone. You wouldn't have me a slacker, mother. I can get into the flying corps. What say, Dad? The doctor's hands were not quite steady as he folded up the powders he was concocting for Abby Flagg's rheumatism. He had known this moment was coming yet he was not altogether prepared for it. He answered slowly, "'I won't try to hold you back from what you believe to be your duty. But you must not go unless your mother says you may.' Shirley said nothing more. He was not a lad of many words. Anne did not say anything more just then, either. She was thinking of little Joyce's grave in the old burying-ground over harbour. Little Joyce, who would have been a woman now, had she lived, of the white cross in France, and the splendid grey eyes of the little boy who had been taught his first lessons of duty and loyalty at her knee, of Jem in the terrible trenches, of Nan and Di and Rilla, waiting, 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 while the golden years of youth passed by. And she wondered if she could bear any more. She thought not. Surely she had given enough. Yet that night she told Shirley that he might go. They did not tell Susan right away. She did not know it until, a few days later, Shirley presented himself in her kitchen in his aviation uniform. Susan didn't make half the fuss she had made when Jem and Walter had gone. She said stonily, "'So they're going to take you, too.' "'Take me? No. I'm going, Susan. Got to.' Susan sat down by the table, folded her old knotted hands that had grown warped and twisted working for the Ingleside children to still their shaking, and said, "'Yes, you must go.' I did not see once why such things must be, but I can see now. "'You're a brick, Susan,' said Shirley. He was relieved that she took it so coolly. He had been a little afraid, with a boy's horror of a scene. He went out whistling gaily, but half an hour later, when pale Anne Blythe came in, Susan was still sitting there. "'Mrs. Dr. dear,' said Susan, making an admission she would once have died rather than make, "'I feel very old. Jem and Walter were yours, but Shirley is mine, and I cannot bear to think of him flying.' his machine crashing down, the life crushed out of his body, the dear little body I nursed and cuddled when he was a wee baby. "'Susan, don't!' cried Anne. "'Oh, Mrs. Dr. dear, I beg your pardon. I ought not to have said anything like that out loud. I sometimes forget that I resolve to be a heroine. This—this this has shaken me a little. But I will not forget myself again. Only if things do not go as smoothly in the kitchen for a few days, I hope you will make due allowance for me. At least— said poor Susan, forcing a grim smile in a desperate effort to require lost standing. At least flying is a clean job. He will not get so dirty and messed up as he would in the trenches. And that is well, for he has always been a tidy child. So Shirley went, not radiantly as to high adventure like Jem, not into a white flame of sacrifice like Walter, but in a cool, business-like mood, as of one doing something rather dirty and disagreeable that had just got to be done. He kissed Susan for the first time since he was five years old, and said, "'Good-bye, Susan. Mother Susan.' "'My little brown boy. My little brown boy,' said Susan. "'I wonder,' she thought bitterly, as she looked at the doctor's sorrowful face, "'if you remember how you spanked him once when he was a baby. 
I am thankful I have nothing like that on my conscience now. The doctor did not remember the old discipline, but before he put on his hat to go out on his round of calls, he stood for a moment in the great silent living room that had once been full of children's laughter. Our last son, our last son, he said aloud, a good, sturdy, sensible lad, too, always reminded me of my father. I suppose I ought to be proud that he wanted to go. I was proud when Jem went, even when Walter went. But our house has left us desolate. I have been thinking, doctor, old Sandy of the Upper Glen said to him that afternoon, that your house will be seeming very big the day. Highland Sandy's quaint phrase struck the doctor as perfectly expressive. Ingleside did seem very big and empty that night, yet Shirley had been away all winter except for weekends, and had always been a quiet fellow even when home. Was it because he had been the only one left that his going seemed to leave such a huge blank, that every room seemed vacant and deserted, that the very trees on the lawn seemed to be trying to comfort each other with caresses of freshly budding boughs for the loss of the last of the little lads who had romped under them in childhood? Susan worked very hard all day and late into the night. When she had wound the kitchen clock and put Dr. Jekyll out, none too gently, she stood for a little while on the doorstep, looking down the glen, which lay tranced in faint, silvery light from a sinking young moon. But Susan did not see the familiar hills and harbour. She was looking at the aviation camp in Kingsport, where Shirley was that night. He called me Mother Susan, she was thinking. Well, all our men folk have gone now. Jem and Walter and Shirley and Jerry and Carl and none of them had to be driven to it, so we have a right to be proud. But pride, Susan sighed bitterly, pride is cold company, and that there is no gainsaying. The moon sank lower into a black cloud in the west, the glen went out in an eclipse of sudden shadow, and thousands of miles away the Canadian boys in khaki, the living and the dead, were in possession of Vimy Ridge. Vimy Ridge is a name written in crimson and gold on the Canadian annals of the Great War. The British couldn't take it, and the French couldn't take it, said a German prisoner to his captors, but you Canadians are such fools that you don't know when a place can't be taken. So the fools took it, and paid the price. Jerry Meredith was seriously wounded at Vimy Ridge, shot in the back, the telegram said. Poor Nan, said Mrs. Blythe when the news came. She thought of her own happy girlhood at Old Green Gables. There had been no tragedy like this in it. How the girls of today had to suffer! When Nan came home from Redmond two weeks later, her face showed what those weeks had meant to her. John Meredith, too, seemed to have grown old suddenly in them. Faith did not come home. She was on her way across the Atlantic as a V.A.D. Di had tried to wring from her father consent to her going also, but had been told that for her mother's sake it could not be given. So Di, after a flying visit home, went back to her Red Cross work in Kingsport. The Mayflowers bloomed in the secret nooks of Rainbow Valley. Rilla was watching for them. Jem had once taken his mother the earliest Mayflowers. Walter brought them to her when Jem was gone. Last spring Shirley had sought them out for her. Now Rilla thought she must take the boy's place in this. But before she had discovered any, Bruce Meredith came to Ingleside one twilight with his hands full of delicate pink sprays. He stalked up the steps of the veranda and laid them on Mrs. Blythe's lap. "'Because Shirley isn't here to bring them,' he said in his funny, shy, blunt way. "'And you thought of this, you darling,' said Anne, her lips quivering, as she looked at the stocky, black-browed little chap standing before her, with his hands thrust into his pockets. "'I wrote Jem today and told him not to worry about you not getting your Mayflowers,' said Bruce seriously, "'cause I'd see to that. And I told him I would be ten pretty soon now, so it won't be very long before I'll be eighteen, and then I'll go to help him fight, and maybe let him come home for a rest while I took his place. I wrote Jerry, too. Jerry's getting better, you know.' Is he? Have you had any good news about him? Yes. Mother had a letter today, and it said he was out of danger. Oh, thank God! murmured Mrs. Blythe in a half whisper. Bruce looked at her curiously. That is what Father said when Mother told him. But when I said it the other day when I found out Mr. Mead's dog hadn't heard my kitten, I thought he had shooken it to death, you know. Father looked awful solemn and said I must never say that again about a kitten. But I couldn't understand why, Mrs. Blythe. I felt awful thankful, and it must have been God that saved Stripey, because that mead dog had enormous jaws, and oh, how it shook poor Stripey! And so why couldn't I thank him? Course, added Bruce reminiscently, maybe I said it too loud, cause I was awful glad and excited when I found Stripey was all right. I most shouted it, Mrs. Blythe. Maybe if I'd said it sort of whispery like you and father it would have been all right. 
Do you know Mrs. Blythe? Bruce dropped to a whispery tone, edging a little nearer to Anne. What I would like to do to the Kaiser if I could? What would you like to do, laddie? Norman Reese said in school today that he would like to tie the Kaiser to a tree and set cross dogs to worrying him, said Bruce gravely. And Emily Flagg said she would like to put him in a cage and poke sharp things into him. And they all said things like that. But Mrs. Blythe— Bruce took a little square paw out of his pocket and put it earnestly on Anne's knee. I would like to turn the Kaiser into a good man, a very good man, all at once if I could. That is what I would do. Don't you think, Mrs. Blythe, that would be the very worstest punishment of all? Bless the child, said Susan. How do you make out that would be any kind of a punishment for that wicked fiend? Don't you see? said Bruce, looking levelly at Susan out of his blackly blue eyes. If he was turned into a good man, he would understand how dreadful the things he has done are, and he would feel so terrible about it that he would be more unhappy and miserable than he could ever be in any other way. He would feel just awful, and he would go on feeling like that forever. Yes, Bruce clenched his hands and nodded his head emphatically. Yes, I would make the Kaiser a good man. That is what I would do. It would serve him exactly right. End of chapter 25. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Karen Savage, Waco, Texas, July 2006. Rilla of Ingleside by Lucy Maud Montgomery. Chapter 26 Susan Has a Proposal of Marriage. An aeroplane was flying over Glen St. Mary, like a great bird poised against the western sky, a sky so clear and of such a pale silvery yellow that it gave an impression of a vast, wind-freshened space of freedom. The little group on the Ingleside lawn looked up at it with fascinated eyes, although it was by no means an unusual thing to see an occasional hovering plane that summer. Susan was always intensely excited. Who knew but that it might be Shirley away up there in the clouds, flying over to the island from Kingsport? But Shirley had gone overseas now, so Susan was not so keenly interested in this particular aeroplane and its pilot. Nevertheless, she looked at it with awe. "'I wonder, Mrs. Dr. dear,' she said solemnly, "'what the old folks down there in the graveyard would think if they could rise out of their graves for one moment and behold that sight. I am sure my father would disapprove of it, for he was a man who did not believe in new-fangled ideas of any sort. He always cut his grain with a reaping hook to the day of his death. A mower he would not have.' What was good enough for his father was good enough for him, he used to say. I hope it is not unfilial to say that I think he was wrong in that point of view, but I am not sure I go so far as to approve of aeroplanes, though they may be a military necessity. If the Almighty had meant us to fly, he would have provided us with wings. Since he did not, it is plain he meant us to stick to the solid earth. At any rate, you will never see me, Mrs. Dr. dear, cavorting through the sky in an aeroplane. "'But you won't refuse to cavort a bit in Father's new automobile when it comes, will you, Susan?' teased Rilla. "'I do not expect to trust my old bones in automobiles either,' retorted Susan. "'But I do not look upon them as some narrow-minded people do. Whiskers on the moon says the government should be turned out of office for permitting them to run on the island at all. He foams at the mouth, they tell me, when he sees one. The other day he saw one coming along that narrow side road by his wheat field, and Whiskers bounded over the fence and stood right in the middle of the road with his pitchfork. The man in the machine was an agent of some kind, and Whiskers hates agents as much as he hates automobiles. He made the car come to a halt, because there was not room to pass him on either side, and the agent could not actually run over him. Then he raised his pitchfork and shouted, "'Get out of this with your devil machine, or I will run this pitchfork clean through you!' And, Mrs. Dr. dear, if you will believe me, that poor agent had to back his car clean out to the Lowbridge Road, nearly a mile, whiskers following him every step, shaking his pitchfork and bellowing insults. Now, Mrs. Dr. dear, I call such conduct unreasonable. But all the same, added Susan with a sigh, what with aeroplanes and automobiles and all the rest of it, this island is not what it used to be. The aeroplane soared and dipped and circled and soared again, until it became a mere speck far over the sunset hills. With the majesty of pinion which the Theban eagles bear, sailing with supreme dominion through the azure fields of air, quoted Anne Blythe dreamily. I wonder, said Miss Oliver, if humanity will be any happier because of aeroplanes. It seems to me that the sum of human happiness remains much the same from age to age, no matter how it may vary in distribution 
and that all the many inventions neither lessen nor increase it. After all, the kingdom of heaven is within you, said Mr. Meredith, gazing after the vanishing speck which symbolized man's latest victory in a world-old struggle. It does not depend on material achievements and triumphs. Nevertheless, an aeroplane is a fascinating thing, said the doctor. It has always been one of humanity's favorite dreams, the dream of flying. Dream after dream comes true, or rather is made true by persevering effort. I should like to have a flight in an aeroplane myself. Shirley wrote me that he was dreadfully disappointed in his first flight, said Rilla. He had expected to experience the sensation of soaring up from the earth like a bird, and instead he just had the feeling that he wasn't moving at all, but that the earth was dropping away under him. And the first time he went up alone he suddenly felt terribly homesick. He had never felt like that before, but all at once, he said, he felt as if he were adrift in space, and he had a wild desire to get back home to the old planet in the companionship of fellow creatures. He soon got over that feeling, but he says his first flight alone was a nightmare to him because of that dreadful sensation of ghastly loneliness. The aeroplane disappeared. The doctor threw back his head with a sigh. When I have watched one of those birdmen out of sight, I come back to earth with an odd feeling of being nearly a crawling insect. Anne, he said, turning to his wife, do you remember the first time I took you for a buggy ride in Avonlea, the night we went to the Carmody concert, the first fall you taught in Avonlea? I had our little black mare with the white star on her forehead and a shining brand new buggy, and I was the proudest fellow in the world, barring none. I suppose our grandson will be taking his sweetheart out quite casually for an evening fly in his aeroplane. An aeroplane won't be as nice as little Silverspot was, said Anne. A machine is simply a machine, but Silverspot, why, she was a personality, Gilbert. A drive behind her had something in it that not even a flight among sunset clouds could have. No. I don't envy my grandson's sweetheart, after all. Mr. Meredith is right. The kingdom of heaven and of love and of happiness doesn't depend on externals. Besides, said the doctor gravely, our said grandson will have to give most of his attention to the aeroplane. He won't be able to let the reins lie on its back while he gazes into his lady's eyes. And I have an awful suspicion that you can't run an aeroplane with one arm. No, the doctor shook his head. I believe I'd still prefer Silver Spot after all. The Russian line broke again that summer, and Susan said bitterly that she had expected it ever since Kerensky had gone and got married. Far be it from me to decry the holy state of matrimony, Mrs. Dr. dear, but I felt that when a man was running a revolution he had his hands full, and should have postponed marriage until a more fitting season. The Russians are done for this time, and there would be no sense in shutting our eyes to the fact. But have you seen Woodrow Wilson's reply to the Pope's peace proposals? It is magnificent. I really could not have expressed the rights of the matter better myself. I feel that I can forgive Wilson everything for it. He knows the meaning of words, and that you may tie to. Speaking of meanings, have you heard the latest story about Whiskers on the Moon, Mrs. Dr. dear? It seems he was over at the Lowbridge Road School the other day, and took a notion to examine the fourth class in spelling. They have the summer term there yet, you know, with the spring and fall vacations, being rather backward people on that road. My niece, Ella Baker, goes to that school, and she it was who told me the story. The teacher was not feeling well, having a dreadful headache, and she went out to get a little fresh air while Mr. Pryor was examining the class. The children got along all right with the spelling, but when Whiskers began to question them about the meanings of the words they were all at sea, because they had not learned them. Ella and the other big scholars felt terrible over it. They love their teacher so, and it seems Mr. Pryor's brother, Abel Pryor, who is trustee of that school, is against her and has been trying to turn the other trustees over to his way of thinking and Ella and the rest were afraid that if the fourth class didn't tell Whiskers the meanings of the words, he would think the teacher was no good and tell Abel so, and Abel would have a fine handle. But little Sandy Logan saved the situation. He is a homeboy, but he is as smart as a steel trap, and he sized up Whiskers on the moon right off. "'What does anatomy mean?' Whiskers demanded. "'A pain in your stomach,' Sandy replied, quick as a flash, and never batting an eyelid. "'Whiskers on the moon is a very ignorant man, Mrs. Dr. Dear. He didn't know the meaning of the words himself, and he said, "'Very good, very good.' The class caught right on. At least three or four of the brighter ones did, and they kept up the fun. Jean Blaine said that acoustic meant a religious squabble, and Muriel Baker said that an agnostic was a man who had indigestion, and Jim Carter said that acerbity meant that you ate nothing but vegetable food, and so on all down the list. Whiskers swallowed it all, and kept saying, "'Very good, very good,' until Ella thought that die she would trying to keep a straight face. 
When the teacher came in, Whiskers complimented her on the splendid understanding the children had of their lesson, and said he meant to tell the trustees what a jewel they had. It was very unusual, he said, to find a fourth class who could answer up so prompt when it came to explaining what words meant. He went off beaming. But Ella told me this as a great secret, Mrs. Dr. dear, and we must keep it as such, for the sake of the Lowbridge Road teacher. It would likely be the ruin of her chances of keeping the school if Whiskers should ever find out how he had been bamboozled. Mary Vance came up to Ingleside that same afternoon to tell them that Miller Douglas, who had been wounded when the Canadians took Hill 70, had had to have his leg amputated. The Ingleside folk sympathized with Mary, whose zeal and patriotism had taken some time to kindle, but now burned with a glow as steady and bright as anyone's. Some folk have been twitting me about having a husband with only one leg. But, said Mary, rising to a lofty height, I would rather Miller with only one leg than any other man in the world with a dozen. Unless, she added as an afterthought, unless it was Lloyd George. Well, I must be going. I thought you'd be interested in hearing about Miller, so I ran up from the store, but I must hustle home, for I promised Luke McAllister I'd help him build his grain stack this evening. It's up to us girls to see that the harvest is got in, since the boys are so scarce. I've got overalls, and I can tell you they're real becoming. Mrs. Alec Douglas says they're indecent and shouldn't be allowed, and even Mrs. Elliot kinder looks askance at them. But, bless you, the world moves, and anyhow there's no fun for me like shocking Kitty Alec. "'By the way, father,' said Rilla, "'I'm going to take Jack Flagg's place in his father's store for a month. I promised him today that I would, if you didn't object. Then he can help the farmers get the harvest in. I don't think I'd be much use in a harvest myself, though lots of the girls are, but I can set Jack free while I do his work. Jim's isn't much bother in the daytime now, and I'll always be home at night.' "'Do you think you'll like weighing out sugar and beans and trafficking in butter and eggs?' said the doctor, twinkling. "'Probably not. That isn't the question. It's just one way of doing my bit.' So Rilla went behind Mr. Flagg's counter for a month, and Susan went into Albert Crawford's oatfields. "'I'm as good as any of them yet,' she said proudly. "'Not a man of them can beat me when it comes to building a stack. When I offered to help, Albert looked doubtful. "'I'm afraid the work will be too hard for you,' he said. "'Try me for a day and see,' said I. "'I will do my darndest.' None of the Ingleside folks spoke for just a moment. Their silence meant that they thought Susan's pluck in working out quite wonderful. But Susan mistook their meaning, and her sunburned face grew red. "'This habit of swearing seems to be growing on me, Mrs. Dr. dear,' she said apologetically. "'To think that I should be acquiring it at my age! It is such a dreadful example to the young girls. I am of the opinion it comes of reading the newspaper so much. They are so full of profanity, and they do not spell it with stars, either, as used to be done in my young days.' This war is demoralizing everybody. Susan, standing on a load of grain, her gray hair whipping in the breeze, and her skirt kilted up to her knees for safety and convenience—no overalls for Susan, if you please—neither a beautiful nor a romantic figure. But the spirit that animated her gaunt arms was the self-same one that captured Vimy Ridge and held the German legions back from Verdun. It is not the least likely, however, that this consideration was the one which appealed most strongly to Mr. Pryor when he drove past one afternoon, and saw Susan pitching sheaves gamely. Smart woman, that, he reflected. Worth two of many a younger one yet. I might do worse. I might do worse. If Milgrave comes home alive, I'll lose Miranda, and hired housekeepers cost more than a wife, and are liable to leave a man in the lurch any time. I'll think it over. A week later, Mrs. Blythe, coming up from the village late in the afternoon, paused at the gate of Ingleside in an amazement which temporarily bereft her of the power of motion. An extraordinary sight met her eyes. Round the end of the kitchen burst Mr. Pryor, running as stout pomp as Mr. Pryor had not run in years, with terror imprinted on every lineament. A terror quite justifiable, for behind him, like an avenging fate, came Susan, with a huge smoking iron pot grasped in her hands, and an expression in her eye that boded ill to the object of her indignation if she should overtake him. Pursuer and pursued tore across the lawn. Mr. Pryor reached the gate a few feet ahead of Susan, wrenched it open, and fled down the road without a glance at the transfixed lady of Ingleside. "'Susan!' gasped Anne. Susan halted in her mad career, set down her pot, and shook her fist after Mr. Pryor, who had not ceased to run, evidently believing that Susan was still full cry after him. "'Susan, what does this mean?' demanded Anne, a little severely. "'You may well ask that, Mrs. Dr. dear,' Susan replied wrathfully. "'I have not been so upset in years. "'That—that—that that, that pacifist has actually had the audacity to come up here and, in my own kitchen, to ask me to marry him! "'Him! 
him!" Anne choked back a laugh. But, Susan, couldn't you have found a, well, a less spectacular method of refusing him? Think what a gossip this would have made if anyone had been going past and had seen such a performance. Indeed, Mrs. Doctor dear, you are quite right. I did not think of it because I was quite past thinking rationally. I was just clean mad. Come in the house, and I will tell you all about it. Susan picked up her pot and marched into the kitchen, still trembling with wrathful excitement. She set her pot on the stove with a vicious thud. Wait a moment until I open all the windows to air this kitchen well, Mrs. Doctor dear. There, that is better. And I must wash my hands too, because I shook hands with Whiskers on the Moon when he came in. Not that I wanted to, but when he stuck out his fat, oily hand, I did not know just what else to do at the moment. I had just finished my afternoon cleaning, and thanks be, everything was shining and spotless. And thought I, now that dye is boiling, and I will get my rug rags and have them nicely out of the way before supper. Just then a shadow fell over the floor, and looking up, I saw Whiskers on the Moon standing in the doorway, dressed up and looking as if he had just been starched and ironed. I shook hands with him, as aforesaid, Mrs. Doctor dear, and told him you and the doctor were both away. But he said, "I have come to see you, Miss Baker." I asked him to sit down for the sake of my own manners, and then I stood there right in the middle of the floor and gazed at him as contemptuously as I could. In spite of his brazen assurance, this seemed to rattle him a little. But he began trying to look sentimental at me out of his little piggy eyes, and all at once an awful suspicion flashed into my mind. Something told me, Mrs. Doctor dear, that I was about to receive my first proposal. I have always thought that I would like to have just one offer of marriage to reject, so that I might be able to look other women in the face. But you will not hear me bragging of this. I consider it an insult, and if I could have thought of any way of preventing it, I would. But just then, Mrs. Doctor dear, you will see I was at a disadvantage, being taken so completely by surprise. Some men, I am told, consider a little preliminary courting the proper thing before a proposal, if only to give fair warning of their intentions. But Whiskers on the Moon probably thought it was any port in a storm for me, and that I would jump at him. Well, he is undeceived. Yes, he is undeceived, Mrs. Doctor dear. I wonder if he has stopped running yet. I understand that you don't feel flattered, Susan. But couldn't you have refused him a little more delicately than by chasing him off the premises in such a fashion? Well, maybe I might have, Mrs. Doctor dear, and I intended to. But one remark he made aggravated me beyond my powers of endurance. If it had not been for that, I would not have chased him with my dye pot. I will tell you the whole interview. Whiskers sat down as I have said, and right beside him on another chair, Doc was lying. The animal was pretending to be asleep, but I knew very well he was not, for he has been Hyde all day, and Hyde never sleeps. By the way, Mrs. Doctor dear, have you noticed that that cat is far oftener Hyde than Jekyll now? The more victories Germany wins, the Hyder he becomes. I leave you to draw your own conclusions from that. I suppose Whiskers thought he might curry favor with me by praising the creature, little dreaming what my real sentiments towards it were. So he stuck out his pudgy hand and stroked Hyde's back. What a nice cat! He said. The nice cat flew at him and bit him. Then it gave a fearful yowl and bounded out of the door. Whiskers looked after it quite amazed. That is a queer kind of a garment, he said. I agreed with him on that point, but I was not going to let him see it. Besides, what business had he to call our cat a varmint? It may be a varmint or it may not, I said, but it knows the difference between a Canadian and a Hun. You would have thought, would you not, Mrs. Doctor dear, that a hint like that would have been enough for him, but it went no deeper than his skin. I saw him settling back quite comfortable, as if for a good talk, and thought I, if there is anything coming, it may as well come soon and be done with, for with all these rags to die before supper, I have no time to waste in flirting. So I spoke right out. If you have anything particular to discuss with me, Mr. Pryor, I would feel obliged if you would mention it without loss of time, because I am very busy this afternoon. He fairly beamed at me out of that circle of red whisker and said, "You are a business-like woman, and I agree with you. There is no use in wasting time beating around the bush. I came up here today to ask you to marry me." So there it was, Mrs. Doctor dear. I had a proposal at last after waiting sixty-four years for one. I just glared at that presumptuous creature and I said. I would not marry you if you were the last man on earth, Josiah Pryor. So there you have my answer, and you can take it away forthwith. You never saw a man so taken aback as he was, Mrs. Doctor dear. He was so flabbergasted that he just blurted out the truth. Why, I thought you'd be only too glad to get a chance to be married," he said. That was when I lost my head, Mrs. Doctor dear. Do you think I had a good excuse when a Hun and a pacifist made such an insulting remark to me? Go! I thundered, and I just caught up that iron pot. 
I could see that he thought I had suddenly gone insane, and I suppose he considered an iron pot full of boiling dye was a dangerous weapon in the hands of a lunatic. At any rate he went, and stood not upon the order of his going, as you saw for yourself. And I do not think we will see him back here proposing to us again in a hurry. No. I think he has learned that there is at least one single woman in Glen St. Mary who has no hankering to become Mrs. Whiskers-on-the-Moon. End of chapter 26